Then Garner's goal. We join Jennifer Garner on her mission to help those who need it most. The contradiction of rural America. This is where our food comes from, but in that grocery store, there's not one fresh apple, there's not one piece of lettuce or spinach, not one banana. Inside her special project for a deserving community. Plus, friends farewell. Co-stars Jennifer Aniston, David Schwimmer, and Lisa Kudrow pay tribute to Matthew Perry inside the touching memories they're now sharing. And Gold Turkey, our annual holiday tradition, is back. 20 all-star chefs gearing up to celebrate Thanksgiving with tips, tricks, and recipes to save you time and money this holiday season. So let's get cooking. Today, Thursday, November 16th, 2023. Hey. We're back at A12. We are catching up with one of our very favorites, Jennifer Garner, and her work with Save the Children. It is a charity organization that has helped more than one billion kids worldwide. And Jennifer herself has focused her efforts on rural areas of the United States. She happens to be standing by with the other part of the dynamic duo, <laughs> NBC's Cynthia McFadden, sharing the group's latest gift. Hey, Cynthia. Good morning. Well, chances are good that at least some of the fresh fruits, vegetables, and nuts on your Thanksgiving table will come from a place that Jennifer and I spent the day visiting yesterday, California's Central Valley. For decades, Save the Children has worked with kids there, most growing up well below the poverty line. Well, we went to see how they're doing and brought a little surprise with us. It's 20,000 square miles of agricultural heaven, California's Central Valley. Half of the nation's fruits and vegetables come from here, and 75% of the nuts. I mean, it doesn't get much more rural than this. No. Jennifer Garner and I took a walk down the main and only street in downtown Alpa. There's one grocery store behind us, one gas station beyond that. And this teeny little tiny library. Tiny little library. Okay. But the contradiction of rural America. This is where our food comes from, but in that grocery store, there's not one fresh apple, there's not one piece of lettuce or no. spinach, not one banana. This is a food desert. Almost all the thousand or so residents here work picking everything from blueberries to pistachios, yet 54% of them live below the poverty line. The grim reality is the people who pick this food cannot afford to eat it. Once a month, families get in line to sample the bounty growing all around them. They're given enough fresh food for about four days. Just about the whole town shows up. At nine, whenever we get our call that there's gonna be food giving away, we're already in line waiting for that because it's, we need it. Save the Children and a local food bank sponsor this distribution. For those who can't make it here, Save the Children delivers. Thank you. Jennifer Gardner has been a board member and an ambassador for Save the Children for 15 years. There is no police station or hospital. What there is is this school, the center of the community and its hope for the future. It's a beautiful day. And top of the school's agenda is battling a staggering literacy problem. Thank you guys for reading with me. Thank you. Thank you. The kids, they all at the end feel entitled to come up and throw their arms around you. It makes me feel like they know I'm on their side. For over 70% of the students here, English is a second language. And while there is a school library, it only has a thousand books total. But things are getting better, a lot better, says the superintendent of schools, Troy Hayes. So what's the evidence it's working? We know that in over a three-year period, we've gone from 18 to 86% of our students meeting college entrance requirements. In three years? In three years. If you were to summarize the secret sauce, it is? I think it's just, it's, it's almost like this extravagant compassion. And that means getting the staff to believe in big dreams so the kids will. There have been such strides made in this community. Mm. What does that say to you? 
It's just a reminder that there is hope. We should be celebrating this superintendent. We should be lifting up these teachers. But more than that, it also just asks us to pay attention. We can't take our eyes off of so much real estate of this country and just let it, let rural America kind of just fall. Last night at the school's annual Thanksgiving celebration, the cafeteria was the place to be for students and their parents. And we came with a couple of surprises. You can take home as many books as you can read. Scholastic donated more than 700 books to the students here at Al Paw Unified Schools so that each child can have books of their very own to take home. We have a room full of readers. And that's not all. Scholastic also pledged an additional 5,000 books to the Alpaw Unified Schools Library. What does it mean to have books? First, the kids have books at home. We are so grateful. This is going to be a huge uh, thing for us in our community, so thank you so much. Okay, it was a wonderful day and a wonderful night. Mm -hmm. we, we were privileged to be there. Mm -hmm. really. uh, well, you too. We love it. When you two get together, we know mm -hmm. something good's going to happen. This mm -hmm. town has so much resilience. The school has shown so much success. Jennifer, how did they do it? How'd they pull it off? They did it with the belief of a superintendent. Leadership is everything. And they did it with Save the Children's Help being there, supporting his vision, supporting the community's vision to lift up these kids and get them reading, get them excited, get them just ready and engaged to learn. Well, Jennifer, you mentioned that 70% of the kids, English is a second language, they're learning English. How do they get ready for kindergarten? Can you imagine how complicated it's hard enough to learn to read and then you're also having to learn a whole new language that your parents don't speak? Well, you know, Save the Children hires locally, so our staff is pretty much bilingual and that really helps reduce the shame that comes with not being able to speak the target language because shame just stops progress, right? And then the books in our book exchanges, they'll be bilingual. They'll have an English word on one side and the Spanish word on the other and that helps the parents learn as well. And of course we teach parents there are all kinds of ways to share a story. You can do a picture walk. As long as you're talking and looking at books together, the magic's happening. Mm -hmm. Cynthia, you've covered so many stories, as we, we keep mm -hmm. saying, you and Jen are like a team now. We, like, we love this. Keep it going. <laughs> but what have you noticed? What's working here? What, mm -hmm. what is separating this work from some of the other things that you've seen? Well, you know, there are so many factors in any success, but one of the things that the superintendent said to me that I thought was so powerful was the first thing he did when he came in four years ago, gather all the teachers. He said, you know, we have to change how we see ourselves. We're not losers. We're winners. And these kids are winners. And when we believe that about ourselves, we can help the kids believe it. You know, dream big. And they really are dreaming big. We, we had wonderful conversations with these children. Yeah, I think it's important to remember, like, these are not poor kids. They are kids living in poor circumstances. Stances. Yes. They've got a, tons of potential. Yep. You guys Absolutely. are you guys are putting 100%. it on display. Keep your show on the road, Keep you guys. Going. You're making us feel so good, <laughs> giving us hope. We appreciate it. Thank you. We have Mississippi coming. Yes. Okay. <laughs> We're ready. Love it, Jen and Cynthia. Thank, thank you, you so much.
We are back with more of our eighth annual Today's All-Star Thanksgiving, and we have brought back some of our favorite chefs and their best recipes and some tips that they've shared with us over the years. At the bottom of the screen, you will see the QR code. So don't worry. We have a new tool where you can just save not just today's 20 recipes, but all the recipes we have on the show. How about that? So let's get to our next five chefs in the lineup. We've got Aisha Nurjaya. She's the executive chef of Shuka here in New York. Spinach noodle casserole. Tell me about this. Well, this is my mom's recipe, so I want to give the credit where credit is due. (laughs) But there's three things you don't leave the house with. Your keys, your lip gloss, and your onion soup mix. Yes, That's it. That is so true. That's what you need. That's what you need. Oh, my gosh. All moms from the 70s. Two eggs in the bowl. We're going to put our onion soup mix in here. And this is the real kicker. This is your dairy creamer for your coffee. Oh, like half and half or yes, something? Yes, this okay. is not the time to use the pumpkin spice. No. You know, I, I want yes. you to have a nice Thanksgiving. So you just whisk this up, and in yes. the bowl here, we have egg noodles that we've cooked with okay. a little bit of butter yes. and some spinach. Okay. My mom uses frozen spinach, but oh, you can yes. use fresh, whatever you'd like. Okay. And then you mix this up, which is like the custard mix. Oh, wow. And we pour it right over. That is so oh, easy. See this? Simple. One, two, three. That's it? You get the onions and everything in there. If you wanted to decadent it up, you could chop some mozzarella in there, mm. finish it in the mm. oven, and get the nice crispy Look edges. Look at that. People will be like, you're speaking my language. Onion <laughs> soup mix. That's so easy. Aisha, thank you. Recipes online. Darnell Ferguson, who, of course, we know, Super Chef Family Cookbook. Sweet potato mac and cheese when two great tastes get together. Yes. Not since the Reese's peanut butter has this been <laughs> it's been so good. This is the side dish that becomes the main course. Oh. You know, so if yeah. you want to steal the show, this is what you do for people. Okay, let's do You know, hear it's it. that sweetness, but not overly sweet. We yeah. combine it with the bechamel, we mix it together. But there's a lot of complications when making mac and cheese. You know, Ooh. you gotta make the sauce, you got the noodles, you gotta bake it. Yeah. So what I want people to do this year is, you know, do your sauce about five days ahead. Okay. Freeze it. That way when the day comes, you can just warm this whole container. Okay. Up in water, boil your noodles the day before. Boil them in milk, though. You know, oh. take a little back a little bit from the okay. prehistoric days. I like know? that. Uh, boil it in milk the day before. Or it gives a little bit of that dairy richness inside of it. Gosh. And then when the day comes, you just got to mix your sauce with your noodles, mm-hmm. with some shredded cheese, okay. put it right inside your bacon dish. You know, you can even bring her some bacon and then toss some breadcrumbs in it, put it right on top. You know, okay. however you like it. All right. You know, but this is like the ultimate mix when it comes to mac and cheese, when it comes to dessert, when it comes to savory, this is it. Okay, so your sauce kind of has that sweet potato yeah. in it. Okay. Sweet potato, maple, cinnamon, all inside of it. Okay, love it. All right, thank you, Darnell. Are you oh, ready? Yeah. Let's move it on. We've got Priyanka Nayak. She's the author of the modern Tiffin cookbook. Okay, I'm pumped about this one. You've got yes. a cranberry sauce, but it's got a special ingredient. What's cooking? Yes, so I'm making an Indian-inspired cranberry sauce. Darnell said his is going to be the star, but this is the real okay. star. Okay! Oh. Throw down! So we have, some, we have some fresh cranberries in here. They're simmering with some orange juice and some tamarind paste, which is a key ingredient in this, as well as some red chilies. We, oh. We're going to need some heat in this because the tartness of the cranberries can mm-hmm. sometimes be too overwhelming, so you want to make sure to balance that with the warmth of the chilies. We're also going to add some brown sugar for some depth Mm -hmm. and some raw cane sugar because I like it a little bit sweet and spicy as well as a cinnamon stick and some cloves. Cloves, And you can make this ahead. You could literally make it today and store it for up to a week in an air air airtight uh, jar container like this and it's really so good I just simmer it for a little bit under 10 minutes and you let those cranberries burst and then you let it come to room temperature and then put it in your jar that may be the star of the show she may be right on that one Priyanka yeah. we'll, we'll have we'll have to see this oh, year okay. 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 Comments, please. Oh, no one's a rematch yes. okay wait but uh, hold on in the game is also Will Coleman he's in the house the chef and founder of Plated Studios yes ma'am he's got cornbread but not your everyday cornbread of course not I'm not your everyday chef either uh, this is cheddar <laughs> cornbread. Show us. Yes, we have a cornbread base right here. The buttermilk, the eggs, the cornmeal. You know all the basics. Stir bar is also fine, but I'm spicing it up with some cheddar cheese, some smoky bacon, spicy jalapeno. Also, add some scallion if you like. But I'm here to let you know to have fun with some cornbread. So you can do mini right here okay. for some little hors d'oeuvres as your guests come in, or regular size for the meal or breakfast like you recommended, uh-huh. which I loved. So you just scoop it in, and you have a beautiful dish to serve with your main course. I don't want no competition. <laughs> yeah. I'm here to have fun <laughs> serving cornbread. By the way, that looks lovely. All right, but. 
you guys, we all know Christina Tosi. Mar right. Martha, we know her oh, very yes. well. Christina is the chef and founder of The Milk Bar. Anyone who's been to New York has been to your place. Yes. Sweets is where my heart is. What do you got for us, Christina? Well, you know, we don't do anything traditional yes. at the center at Milk Bar, so I brought pumpkin pie bars. What I love about them is they start with this really great one bowl wonder of what we call pie crumbs. So it's the same ingredients, butter, flour, sugar, salt, a okay. little bit of cold water. You reserve some of that for the top and then you press Wish the rest just into a nine by 13 pan. We all have this stress about making the perfect Thanksgiving dessert. Yeah, yeah. The perfect Thanksgiving pie, but why not break that a little Mix bit? See it up. on the roll. All right. So once half of that pie crumb is in, you take some pumpkin puree. There's pumpkin a little puree. bit of sugar, okay. some egg. You can Sorry. add spice to it if you want. Get in there, Hoda. Okay, so you just Holy slather it prep, all on it up. That's it. You spread it across a 9 by 13 okay, pan. Okay, and then what? And by the way, then you take the remaining crumb that you have and you leave Put it on, on top, top for texture, for color. Get a little caramelization of that yes, butter. Get in there. Hoda, don't you want to try I'm one? Dying. Right I mean, now. get in there. And the best part is if you're not a pumpkin family, maybe you're sweet potato, Will and I were talking. Mm, maybe it's sweet potato you. and marshmallow. Thank you. Maybe it's a gooey cinnamon apple, some caramel, whatever it is. Add it all, a mode, some whipped cream. You know we got pumpkin on the menu at Milk Bar. Oh, this is uh, insane. What a delicious. start. Chef, really thank good. you. Really so good. yummy. <laughs>Welcome back to today's all-star Thanksgiving, our next batch of amazing chefs ready to serve up the secrets to the most popular Turkey Day recipes. You can find and save their recipes and tips by scanning the QR code right there near Mr. Melvin. First up, Chef Rick Martinez. He is the author of best-selling cookbook, Mi Cochina. He is bringing us a festive cranberry bacon cheese ball, as opposed to Craig, who's just a cheese ball. Oh, wow. <laughs> Minding my own business. <laughs> just a little drive-by yeah, right there. Man. Okay, so what do we, how do we get started here? Okay, so this is one of those make-ahead appetizers. I mm -hmm. love having really, really nice appetizers. Mm -hmm. So when the guest comes in, you give them a drink, right. you give them an appetizer. This is something that you can make ahead using a lot of the ingredients that you probably already have in your kitchen, uh -huh. like cranberries, like pecans, right. rosemary. Mm -hmm. It's a cheese ball. So right. what we have, we have our toasted pecans, cranberries, right. a little bit of chili morita mm -hmm. because I am live in Mexico. I sure. need a little spice. Come on. We grind that up. We've got our bacon, rosemary, and this is our cheese ball. So it's cream cheese, mm -hmm. white cheddar, a, half of the bacon cranberry mixture. Um, you basically just put it, make it into a little ball, uh -huh. and then we just like push in all of this delicious bacon so just cranberry. Roll it around and get roll it. Roll it there. around. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. End up with this, you end up with this. It's great because you can make this a few days ahead. Keep it in the okay. fridge. Guest comes in, serve it. Brick, thank you. Let's spin. Oh, Lord. 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 Oh, Lord.
didn't sign up for this. Hold on. Right. 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 We got oh, Allison please. Roman. Wow. The right all over. For, for wow. So we got to stop. Uh, is that stop wild? Space. Is that wild? Okay. <laughs> Recipe for a yes. mushroom pot pie from her best-selling cookbook, Sweet Enough. Okay. Yes. You've settled down? Okay. Awesome. That was like uh, being on a roller coaster. All I right. need some drama mean. So, um, <laughs> what are we making? We are making a mushroom pot pie, which mm -hmm. could be a side, could also be a vegetarian main course, which oh. I get questions for all the time. Mm -hmm. Like, how do you do vegetarian or somebody who doesn't eat meat for the holiday? Right. And this, to me, is like meaty and unctuous and fantastic and celebratory. Unctuous. And unctuous, a word unctuous. I've never right. said on right. television or like otherwise. That. I like that. Um, but it's sort of basic pot pie filling where mm -hmm. you make like a gravy and instead of meat, it's mushrooms. So okay. I like to do a mixture of mushrooms. So mm -hmm. you have like common button and, you know, oyster and well, my taki. This is just some butter. Uh -huh. So what will happen is as it cooks in the crust, mm -hmm. it thickens, almost like mushroom gravy. Okay. But it makes itself in the pie. And there was just some flour you put in there? Yeah. Okay. And you can use a different alternative, but mm -hmm. I'm assuming if you're doing pie crust, you're probably not gluten-free. Okay. So. There you go. Um, or make a tiny one. How cute is that? Make a little bitty one. All yeah. right. All right, Allison, hold on. Okay. We're about to oh spin. Oh, okay. okay. Brace yourself. Your turn. Bye. Brace yourself. Bye. Moving around the circle, this is the chef and owner of Carriage House right here in New York City. This is Chef Jordan Andino. He's got one spicy pork and sweet potato casserole. This looks good. How do you keep it from sticking to the bottom? Right, here's how you keep it from sticking to the bottom. Fat. Fat is flavor. Yeah. Butter. Look at that. That's a lot right, of right there. That, that, that's, all, that's all you got to do. So here's the thing. My stuffing is delicious because I like to add spice to it, right? You got a lot yeah. of fat, a lot of different starches. You want those, those bold flavors. Enter habanero, enter jalapeno, or oh. even, even like scotch bonnet if you're trying to get really good with it. So what you're going to do is you're going to add some gravy from the turkey, added from whatever to the stuffing that yeah. helps bind it. And you're going to rehydrate with some of these delicious breadcrumbs. So now the stuffing gets some of that turkey all up in it. And then now, of course, those juices. Add some parsley to keep it light. We like some vegetables in our yeah. in it a little bit, right? So some parsley is, is what we're going to do. And then what you got to do is just put it in and just dump it right into that base. You're going to notice there is a generous heaping of butter here. There's a lot of butter. <laughs> but listen, fat is flavor. Fat is delicious. And once you roast this and bake it at a... I would say about 375 degrees for about 40 minutes. You're going to get this delicious, crispy, crusty, right. amazing stuffing. Chef Jordan and Dino, Chef, thank you. thank you. Spin! We're moving again. Oh, we're <laughs> oh, here's a familiar face. <laughs> Please hold my hand. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like this. The best chef in the Daily House, Osiri Daily. Welcome, <laughs> author thank of you. Seriously Delicious. Your green bean casserole is legendary. Green bean casserole. I'm from Minnesota, you know, the, the home of casseroles and hot dish. Mm. Um, the first, my tip of the day, when you par cook your beans, then plop them in an ice bath. What, what it's very do? important. It'll stop the cooking process. It'll also help them retain this nice, gray, oh. bright green uh, color. You don't want, no one wants like forest green, mushy right. green beans. So here's our beans. Um, nothing wrong with a can of, you know, cream of condensed soup, but I yes. made my own with shiitake mushrooms, oh, onions. Shiitake. We make a little roux. And then, so we're going to add this to our green beans and just kind of toss them to coat. And we'll bake that. Um, and then again, nothing wrong with your, you know, store-bought fried, fried onions. onions. Yes. However, I have um, a recipe and uh, to make fried shallots. They're delicious. I make extra, put them on everything, keep them on in a bowl, and just you know, top them on to absolutely everything. Oh my gosh! We're oh, moving. we're moving. <laughs> we're moving. <laughs> we're moving. <laughs> Carson, that looks like some good stream bean casserole there, brother. It's delicious. Bro. All right. Delicious. Last Love but certainly it. not least, this is uh, dessert time. Yeah. Uh, Bullock Prado, thank you for being here. The author of My Vermont Table, serving up a holiday caramel apple pie. Yeah. This well, is, this looks pretty impressive. So first tip: if you don't want to make that really complicated lattice, then get a seasonal cookie cutter mm -hmm. and just stamp those puppies out and then slather the top. I also bake extras with a little egg wash and sugar so that you can place them on top, oh, nibble as cute. you're going. It's cute. And some people don't like baked fruit. So you have these little, it's like little poppers. You can just stick them in your mouth. They're delicious. And what kind of apples do you use? I use Granny Smith, Macintosh, whatever's good and doesn't get mushy. The other thing, the oh, other chef. tip, if you uh, make really untender crust, yep. put about a third of the water, use vodka instead. Oh, okay, Carson, that's a good and tease. It, and it'll keep Ooh, you spinning. Let's spin again. Carson's going to take us home next We're hour. We're spinning. Next hour. Keep next you spinning. Hour. Eight more excellent spin. chefs standing by to tell us one Come thing on, that they always do on Thanksgiving. But first, this is today on NBC. Good stuff, guys. Good stuff. Tips. Happy Thanksgiving, everybody. Get an early start.
Well, we're having a great time this morning. Welcome back to 8th Annual Today, All-Star Thanksgiving. We're calling this part the final part, Things I Always Do. We've got eight of our all-star chefs here to tell us one thing that's non-negotiable when it comes to their holiday meal. We do this from experience. You guys are the pros. It's something that is a must-do for people watching. Marcus Samuelson, we're going to start with you. Yes. Just please, everybody start with, I always, and then fill in the blank. I always have my drinks ready for my guests. This is my delicious Swedish plug. Yes. What do you serve, Marcus? Nice. People walk into the Samuelson house. What is it? So this is well, red sangria. wine. Yeah, basically a Swedish sangria, but warm. Yep. And it has cinnamon Get and the toasty cloves. early. Exactly. <laughs> Super delicious. Super Very delicious. Good. Melissa Clark, you're up. I always... I, I always gather leaves from my backyard to put on the table because I am cooking. I do not have time to do a fancy table arrangement. These are beautiful. Put them on the table. They're sustainable. At the end, you just throw them out. Wow. And they're so pretty. That works better if you don't have a dog, by the way. Yeah. Yeah. Next up is Elizabeth High School. Elizabeth? I always make sure that I have to-go containers. It's the best way to make sure your guests know when to leave. So when you're <laughs> ready for them to head on out the door, hand them this, open but I the door. Had, but that, I haven't that, had no, dessert sorry, yet. Good day, good I have day, to go? Okay. <laughs> Very good. J.J. Johnson, you're up. I always have a sharp knife, and I make sure everybody in my house has a sharp knife. Good it's idea. key because you see this, you're going to see this beautiful turkey. You don't want that turkey to be shredded. So if you can't sharpen your knife, you can go to your local hardware store. They'll do that. You can call. You can, There's Excellent. people that show up to your house in a truck that will sharpen your knives. Wow. But the knife is the most important part to make sure the meal looks and tastes good. Don't Trust let those me. people come into your home. You no, go to no, them. No, in the no. You, <laughs> go, you, go, you go to them. Don't let them come in. Especially if they've got a knife. <laughs> Hattie McKinnon. So I always create these little play settings with these cute little oh, apples. Wow. Put that on every plate, and that That's way everybody horrible. knows where they're sitting. So no fights at the uh, table. Ninety percent of this country will do that now. Thank yes. you. Yes. <laughs> Our pal Matt Abdu. Matt, what do you got? Hey there? guys, I always like to take my turkey after it's been brined and put it in your refrigerator without anything on top of it. It's going to help dry out that skin. So when it comes time to put that butter on it, we don't all have Martha Stewart at our homes to butter our turkey for us. So <laughs> it'll help get that butter to really adhere to that turkey really well. So when it comes time to roasting it, you're going to get a nice crispy skin. Maya Camille Broussard, great to have you. You always? I always use the list of mason jars to make individual pies because, you know, moderation is key when it comes to sweets. Well, that's a great idea. So I just take the list, put a little bit of crust in it, punch some holes in it, of course, to dock the crust, and then fill it with whatever the minis. like. Oh, minis. Oh, that's awesome. What a great idea. Well done. Pop -tarts. <laughs> Alejandra Ramos. Hello. I got? always keep the sink clear. So you take. <laughs> I also but always make my heavy. husband do the dishes, and I put Al Roker to work. Uh, yeah. Keep a tub filled with soapy water. You can put the dishes in there after you scrape them, and then afterwards oh. you can do the dishes or have someone else do the dishes for you. Well, that is fantastic. Yes. How about a round of applause for Woo! all of them? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> More holiday cooking coming up in a little bit. We're going to see you guys in the third and fourth hours. And again, don't forget to scan that QR code there to find and save all 20 of today's recipes so they are ready for you when you need them. Thanksgiving is one week. What do we learn today? You guys are fantastic. Yes. Thank you. Yes. All those great, useful tips. We appreciate it. And we're back after a quick check of your local news and weather. But stick around. Thank you, guys. And this morning on the third hour of today, royal drama. The final season of The Crown arrives overnight. You know, I think that's been the story of my whole life. Putting Princess Diana in the spotlight. How is the royal family reacting? We'll head live to London. Then later, Roker's roles. Our buddy Al taking a look back at all of his memorable cameos. He's not my boyfriend. He's not? Interesting. From Seinfeld to The Simpsons to SNL, as Al prepares to celebrate his own movie milestone. Plus, another class act, Paul Giamatti, live sharing his new film, Talk Billions and More. And then an all-star Thanksgiving celebration with one week to go. We're talking turkey sides and, of course, dessert with some of the best chefs around. That's all ahead today, Thursday, November 16th, 2023. Live from Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, this is the third hour of today.
Good morning. I'm looking forward to today. It's going to yeah. be fun. I'm like, I'm watching TV downstairs. Like, I want some. There's more. Uh, welcome oh, yeah. to the third hour today. I'm Chanel here with Al and Craig. Uh, thanks for being with us on this Thursday morning. And yes, we are one week mm. away from Thanksgiving. And boy, do we have a treat for you this morning. Six all-star chefs are going to help us put a whole meal together from the turkey to the size to the dessert. We have a dream team this morning. Ooh. These folks have you covered in just a minute. Bobby Flay is standing by. What a, we're such a givers woman. this morning. Bobby, it's Bobby's gravy train. Bobby's, Bobby's gravy train. We're going to jump on Bobby's standing gravy by. train. And you know, I will say we've done this before. Um, and we do it usually a little later in the year. Yeah, like we do it. We do it the week, it's like the day before right. Thanksgiving. But this year, I feel like it gives you a chance to actually go out and shop and really actually get ready. prepare. People complain. That's why we. Change. Oh, really? That's right. Two people. Oh, America has spoken. They're like, we want to make these things, but we only have a day. Yes. We listen. All there right. you go. You. So there now, you go. Now, okay, you're going to be binging on Thursday, but <laughs> coming up this hour, we're going to start with a different kind of binging. Overnight, Netflix dropping the first four episodes from the final season of The Crown. The see this season, it shifts the focus more to Princess Diana's time at Buckingham Palace. And of course, as you might imagine, reaction has been really swift. NBC's Kelly Cobiea has been up all night binging herself so that you don't have to. She's live in London. Kelly, what's the deets? Yeah, there's lots of controversy in this final season and in these four episodes in particular, including a recreation of Prince Harry and Prince William's final conversation with their mother, Princess Diana, just hours before she died. Now, The Telegraph is reporting today that Prince Harry is expected to watch it, but cites sources saying that his brother will not. This series retells a tragic time that left lasting scars on the royal family. This morning, Netflix dropping the first run of the Crown series in its sixth and final season. Don't really understand how I ended up here. Dashing around. And losing sight of myself in the process. Dramatizing Princess Diana's life in the spotlight. And the press are on our tails constantly. We finally succeeded in turning this house upside down. That's never my intention. And her tragic death. But against a background of raw emotion, the royal family remained silent. One of the most difficult periods of the late Queen Elizabeth's reign. What do people want from me? For you to be mother to the nation. Diana was killed in a Paris car crash in 1997, chased by the paparazzi. Her death shocked the world. Britain was in mourning. The royal family seen as cold and uncaring. Since last Sunday, prompting the Queen to make her first and only live TV address to the nation. Filming for season six was put on hold out of respect for the Queen after her death last year. But now, ready for release, the final episode's the most controversial yet, with Diana portrayed as a ghost, reaching out to Charles. Thank you for how you were in the hospital. So raw, broken, and handsome. And to the Queen herself. You've taught us what it means to be British. Maybe it's time to show you're ready to learn too. The series also portraying the Annus Horribilis, 1992, the year of three royal divorces, endless tabloid headlines, and the fire at Windsor Castle. But it ends around 2005 and doesn't cover the ongoing rift between Prince Harry and his brother Prince William and father King Charles. Whatever those behind palace walls think of the crown, it has raised interest in the British royal family. Fundamentally, the royal family as a whole does benefit uh, from The Crown. It's one of the most popular TV series ever made. So the reviews on this side of the pond are not great. Critics really unhappy with those ghost scenes. But you can judge for yourself. The first four episodes are available now. The last six come out in December, depicting the wedding of the now king and queen. And guys, William and Kate's romance as university students. So those ones should be interesting. You have to wait for those, though. People say whatever, but they watch. Do you know yeah. what I mean? Well, that's what Netflix yeah. is over. Oh, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Interesting. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Thank you, Kelly. All right. Well, as we mentioned, we've got some culinary royalty with us here in studio this morning, all morning. 
We have been cooking with our all-star chefs, and right now we have Bobby Flay sticking around. Of course, you can catch him in Beat Bobby Flay Holiday Throwdown. So it's cool. on the Food Network. You can also catch him at his newest restaurant, Brasserie B, which opens in Las Vegas next month. Right now, though, Mr. Flay is going to answer your questions. Wow. We've got sound effects because it's called Bobby's Gravy Train. Hey. All right. That's, an, that's the name of my next new, new, new restaurant. That's okay. Bobby's Gravy, gravy Train. train. I love it. There. All right, let's dig right in. <laughs> yeah. This is the first question. The first okay. passenger on the gravy train. This is Amy. Amy stopped by our plaza recently. Okay. I travel an hour for Thanksgiving to my parents' house. What is a dish that travels well? And what is a dish that does not travel well? Oh, that's, a, that's a very good question because a lot of times people bring stuff to people's houses. I would say don't make mashed potatoes and, and, and travel them. They, mm -hmm. They're probably going to get kind of gluey and uh, not really good. But if you want to make a potato dish, make a potato gratin. Uh -huh. So you, it's basically a potato very thinly sliced in a casserole dish. And casseroles reheat very well. Oh, that's good advice. Right. Boom. Okay. Our next question comes from Luke in Wisconsin. Okay. All right. Hi, Bobby. What's a vegetarian main course that everyone at the table can enjoy this Thanksgiving? That's a great yeah. question. But that's a great question, but obviously yeah. a lot of people are eating uh, just vegetables these days. Sure. Yep. I think of like getting a squash, roasting it, mm -hmm. putting some like of those autumn spices on it and uh -huh. stuff, and then and then stuffing it with your with your vegetarian stuffing. I made one earlier today yeah. with cornbread and wild mushrooms. I put chicken stock in mine, but you can actually do vegetable stock sure. or just water. Mm -hmm. to Wait, is there it. any left? That sounds and then, amazing. And then you can roast the squash <laughs> with the stuffing. Uh huh. Delicious. Boom. Ooh, there you go. That sounds good. All right. Next up is our Plaza fan Shoni, who's looking to spice up a classic. A few years ago, I started making my own cranberry sauce, and it's very simple. And I want to know, what can I add to it to jazz it up? One of my favorite things to put in cranberry sauce, I love cranberry sauce, by the way, is fresh ginger. Oh. Because it's got that sweet spice to it. Yeah. And it really cuts through the, the, the uh, cranberries. The, the one thing I'll say about cranberries is they, um, they kind of fake us out because they're that beautiful r ruby red color, yeah. but they're very tart. Yes. You need a lot of sugar in there. Yep. Sugar, honey, molasses, maple syrup, anything along those lines, but get some fresh ginger in there as well. All right. Good advice. All right, last but not least, on our gravy train, are you enjoying our train? Yes. Uh, we have one more question from a very special viewer. Bobby, by the way, before we started the yes. segment, he said, do you have any of my family members? And I said, no, we don't have any. Yeah. Yeah, no. So technically that is true. No, right. we, we had one of your family members last year. Oh, that's right. We have Betty okay. Jump. Okay, okay this one's from a special viewer. Her name is Christina in New York. Not a family member. Because you know that I always ask everybody the same question on Thanksgiving, and I'm definitely going to make everybody go around the table and answer it this year. I thought I'd ask you this now. What are you most grateful for this year? Oh. Uh, what was the question? What are you oh. grateful? What are you grateful for? I'm obviously grateful for my girlfriend because there she That's is, Christina girlfriend. Perez. Yes. And that is actually that is um, uh, our Pomeranian allspice. Oh, allspice. allspice. Of course, like your that. dog's named Allspice. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right. Bobby, thank you. So sweet. I we'll see you in a little bit. Uh, we're gonna have much. We more got him. With uh, every year we get him. Much more with the all-star chefs coming up. Oh, that was fun. All right. When we come back, do you like how I toss it there? Like no big deal. Uh, okay, yeah. Fine. Nice. Uh, when we come back, what do? Here's a question for you: An alien, a zombie, and a pirate have in common? Well, guess what? Al Roker here has played them all. All of them. We're going to look back at all of his cameos and roles over the years as he celebrates a movie milestone. How all amazing is that? Yeah. I love that. And then later, full-time actor Paul Giamatti is here. Hey, hey, yes. Filling us a real actor. His brand new movie. <laughs> we'll be Thank right. God. We'll be right back. I saw it.
Okay, we are back with a special first look at a big moment for our friend Al Roker. He has appeared in 49 films and TV shows over the past 20 years. Yes, we counted, and we are exclusively re revealing his 50th cam cameo right here, right now. So earlier this week, uh, Kenan Thompson, Kel Mitchell, they told us about Good Burger 2, the long-awaited sequel to their 1997 comedy. Well, this, this actually features a scene stealer from Mr. Roker himself. Take a look. All you gotta do is press the button, weather shows up behind you. Okay. <laughs> oh, there you go. I had such a great time with That's them cute. filming that scene. And I, I have been lucky enough to play around a handful of iconic sets. So uh, we decided to, uh, my, actually my producers decided to take a look back at some of my favorite memories and roles. So I apologize in advance for making you watch me make a scene. Oh, uh, that was good. Now, without further ado, three hours of fireworks. <laughs> It is hard to believe that uh, a guy who's a weather person growing up in Queens, New York, who watched all these TV shows and movies, gets to be in them. That's kind of cool because that means you live on forever. They had me on a TV guide cover. I was briefly on set with Jerry because he uh, sticks his hands through with a gyro sandwich. Elaine! And then I walk through, grab the sandwich, and sit across from Elaine. In the old days, there would be a punchline, and then they'd freeze frame it, and then the credits would roll. So, my last line. He's not? Interesting. And she looks, it's me, and I go. Some of them under constant surveillance. Zed brings Will Smith and Tommy Lee Jones into this one control area, and it's where they monitor all alien activity on Earth. And there I am doing weather. So Deborah, Courtney, and I had gone to the premiere. Courtney goes, what? Wait, you're an alien? And Deborah said, that explains a lot. Two things happening here. We're out of the window, uh, people are out there. I said, hey, so I understand you want Jill to marry you. Well, I love Jill, but I love Jeff Moore. And with that, turns to the guy next to him and gives him a big open mouth kiss. I go, you won't even see that on Will and Grace. So they decide to write that into the script and just Jack and Will end up kissing on the Today Show. You know, I'm very proud of that. I can make things happen for you. Uh, I'm a wish granting genie Al Roker, but be careful for what you wish for. It is kind of fun being a kind of bad guy, you know, because you get to say things and do things that are opposite of who you are. Or is it? <laughs> What's great about doing animation is that, you know, you can literally be anybody you want. Willie Geist and I got to be in Kung Fu Panda 3. We played cousins dim and some. The bulk of our lines was, oh, ah, oh. It's the looting. I did the pirate movie. I played the pirate who likes sunsets and kittens. Killer storm on the way. The Simpsons, longest running show on television. Get out there and enjoy that great, big, beautiful sun. The Adventures of Superman. You could see me giving a forecast for Martha Kent in Smallville. Can you try now? Can you give me a little hairball now? Come on. I'm interviewing Bill Murray. During my interview, I turn into a zombie, and I am killed by Bill Murray. And I had to do a stunt where he hits me with a folding chair, which was actually made out of foam rubber. In between takes, Woody Harrelson said, hey, Al, we're having a party out of the house. Come on out. And I thought, mm, maybe not. <laughs> you wouldn't leave me. Reinstate him, or I'll walk and take my guaranteed contract with me. I had, like, Deborah helping me run lines. But I really did like the idea that there's this version of Al Roker that hangs out with an international criminal. It's like, ooh, look at me, Mr. Danger. It's Roker. Oh, OK. Yeah, that was great. Mr. Roker. I was at a party at Savannah's house. One of the creators and, and writers of the show was there at the party. And he said, oh, you know, we should, we should do something on weather in billions. Uh, yeah, okay. Al, I need you to enlighten me on all things hurricane. Okay, hit me. The day it dropped, all these texts, I can't believe, I saw you in, why didn't you tell me you were in billions? I didn't know you were gonna be in billions. No, no, let me just turn on the news. They're calling it a miracle. The sketch is, there's a new COVID variant. 
But this COVID variant makes you feel cool. All right, who's hungry? Did somebody say hungry? Come and get it. And as it goes on, I become Al 40 Hands Roker. 40 Hands means you've got two big bottles of cheap ale strapped to your hands. Who knew? That was kind of fun. It's a very short stepping stone from that to actually hosting SNL. So that's my next goal. Good Done. Lord. Just and we only it. hit like half of them. Oh, I didn't remember a lot of them. That is amazing. Well, you know, I've, it, it, look, it, a lot of it's proximity, you know. I mean, no, it's I knew, not. I knew, Don't short sell yourself. No, I'm, you know, like, I have the record of having the most guest appearances on Conan O'Brien. Why? Because when somebody, you know, couldn't get in because of weather or something like that, I was literally across the hall. <laughs> so they'd call me in, you know. Tina Fey wanted to use me on 30 Rock. I'm already there. Oh, oh stop. But is it a pinch me thing? I mean, to see Yeah, it is. It's, it's, it's really kind of bizarre, you know, uh, because, you know, you don't, listen, we all started in local news, yeah. you know, so you're very happy with the group that you're with. Yeah. But uh, the get a chance to do things like this it's and that people you know say okay let's here's let's bring this guy in to make a fool of himself for 10 seconds mm -hmm. well great. here's my thing you're loved and you're also respected we should also mention al isn't just in the movies he was also just featured on the route 100 most influential black americans list wow and how's this for a power couple al's wife deborah is also on the list y'all are just couple goals well, i'm telling you they must be low in the bar oh, yes, stop. Stop it. but you i thank you thank you, thank you very much that's, that's very amazing nice. that's congratulations nice. congratulations thank you you want us to tell you something else? Though? That's, no. all we, that's all we got. Feels like this is kind of an old bit. <laughs> you keep saying that. Yeah, when you, we you come back, back, you know? When we come back, a guy who actually does act for a living. <laughs> yes. Thank Paul you. Giamatti. He is here <laughs> live in Studio 1A. He's going to fill us in on his new movie, which is just fantastic. It is. It's already getting award show buzz. We're going to talk about billions as well. The third hour of today, right back after this. today every day we are adding to the star power in our studio the biggest names only on today see we're coming in this early right everybody it's today like i won the lottery how do you feel at this age this stage liberated we're just getting started folks ain't no stop with us now <laughs> the boys are back in town the boys are back in town it's a miracle. It's a miracle. this has been fantastic everything and everyone you're talking about only on today We are back with one incredibly talented and versatile actor. We all love Paul Giamatti for his roles in classic films mm. like the si like Sideways, his portrayal of founding father in John Adams. Paul's latest movie is called The Holdovers. He plays a prep school instructor forced to babysit a handful of students over the holidays. And let's just say Paul's character is not exactly thrilled about it. <laughs> I can tell by your faces that many of you are shocked at the outcome. I, on the other hand, am not, because I have had the misfortune of teaching you this semester, and even with my ocular limitations, I witness firsthand your glazed, uncomprehending expressions. Sir, I don't understand. That's glaringly apparent. <laughs> I mean, oh dear. Paul, good morning. Uh, good morning. Good morning. Oh, oh, oh. I'm not like that. I'm yeah. a nice man. Yeah. I mean, as you were saying, I'm actually a decent person, you I are. think. I, I watched it yesterday. It's just fantastic. Thank you it's very much. Already getting some awards buzz, as yeah. it should. Yeah. Um, the script is sharp. It's funny. Yes. A little melancholy sometimes. Yep, but funny. Yep. What drew you to the role? 
It's an eccentric part. It was a kind of funny, eccentric part. But he, I like these parts where the, the layers get peeled away and you begin mm. to see that there's somebody else underneath this hard, rough exterior. And I just thought he was a fun, interesting character. He's and it's a very, a very intimate cast. Yes. A student, a teacher, and the school <clears throat> cook, they're all stuck together. What was it like? together. It was a very intimate feeling set. It yeah. was nice. It was like just this little group of people. The, the, the crew wasn't huge. The director is Alexander Payne, who's a genius at making it feel very, very warm mm -hmm. and intimate and nice. So it was very special. And it was up in Massachusetts mm -hmm. in these beautiful settings. It's snowing. It felt lovely. You know, in fact, you, you mentioned Alexander Payne. You last worked with him yes. almost 20 years ago on Sideways. Yes, yes you know, it, 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 Which is hard to believe. It's been almost 20 years. I know. But that was really such a groundbreaking movie. When, yeah. when you look back on that, what was that like? Well, that? I, nobody, ex I didn't expect that movie to be anything. Anybody, I was like a wine movie with a whole, like, <laughs> who's going to go see this? And then it was this enormous hit, which was fantastic. And it's, I've never been in anything that's still so present. Mm -hmm. People talk to me like it was just made. Yeah. And it's fantastic. And an actor, most actors don't even have one of those projects right. like that. And so that's great. You know, it's funny. Uh, you and I have something in common in yes. that we both want to be cartoonists, Correct. comic strip artists. Yes. Uh, we've talked about that. But also, uh, just finished up, I was fortunate enough to be in the last season of Billions. Yes. It was one of the best series yes. finale. I'm glad to hear that. Yes. That I have seen in a long time. It ended in a kind of warm way, which yes. for that show was the biggest twist they could have done. Oh. Yes. Was I think it was the most unexpected thing was to have a kind of end in a, in a, in a, with kindness in yeah. some ways. So that was interesting. Yeah. Did you expect that when no, you were this? I don't think any of I expected it to be this mayhem, a bloodbath. <laughs> I don't know what was going to happen to anybody. And then we got this and I thought, what a nice way to end this. Uh, yeah. And that's a nice way to end this as well. Yeah. Oh, thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Please so come much. back. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Happy early glad. Thanksgiving, by the way. Thank you. You too. Thank you. Again, folks, it really is a fantastic film. It's called The Holdovers. It is out now in theaters nationwide. So good. All right, when we come back, the moment we've all been waiting for. Our all-star chefs are here with recipes for your Thanksgiving table. The turkey, gravy, desserts, and drinks. Oh, yeah. We're going to get you cooking when the third hour of today comes right back. <laughs> back. Today's all-star Thanksgiving celebration rolls on all morning long. We've had some incredibly talented chefs. They've been sharing their recipes. They've been sharing their cooking secrets. It's just one of the beautiful times of the year, no question about it. So now we're keeping the party going with more food and fun. By the way, if you want to save any of these recipes for your turkey day, just scan the QR code right there on your uh, on your screen and we'll get to it. Oh, I was like, it. why does he point to my screen? <laughs> <laughs> That's QR code, Elizabeth. It's QR All right, so, code. All right, so everybody get to their places. We're going to kick it off with the chef and partner of Pig Beach BBQ, which has a new location, by the way, right. in Louisville, Kentucky. Oh, Matt Abdu, yeah. congratulations. Thank you very much for that. Really quickly, I think it's important to set the, the tone here. What are you thankful for? Uh, well, for me, it's very easy. I'm very thankful for my amazing wife, Megan. Love you. Yay. My little munchkin, Luke, and my one-year-old daughter, Ava. There they all are right there. Oh, I love that. And of course, for all of our Pig Beach family in Louisville, Kentucky, and New York City, and West Palm Beach, Florida, we're just super grateful for everybody. I love that. I love that. Shall we start cooking? Let's start cooking. Let's do okay. it. So we're doing a state fair style Universal Park kind of turkey leg kind of mm. thing. For me, there's never enough of the legs to go around at Thanksgiving dinner, so why not cook a couple extra just I'm to have? Pick yeah. up a good old uh, turkey leg, why not? But the first thing 
whenever you're cooking any sort of turkey, whether it's a leg or the whole bird, I love to start off with a brine. Got a brine. It's very important, as we all know, for that, that moisture and that seasoning to actually get into the meat. And it's super simple. Okay. For me, it's water, salt, and sugar. Oh. You can add aromatics, you can add thyme, rosemary, garlic, peppercorn, bay leaf, whatever you want to really add up that flavor. But you're simply just going to whisk it together until the water turns clear. And then what I love to do is put my turkey legs in a Ziploc bag, pour the brine over them, put them in the refrigerator overnight. And then by the next day, we're going to take them out. We're going to dry them off as best as we can. Okay. Um, that same tip I gave earlier about the whole bird it also applies to the turkey legs by letting it dry in the refrigerator a little bit overnight to get that skin nice and dry. Ah. And we're simply just going to do a very easy right. seasoning with them by taking some oil. We're going to brush our turkey legs with that oil and make a really quick seasoning with just some garlic, onion, paprika, chili, mm -hmm. black pepper, and salt. Season that all over onto our turkey mm. legs. Roast them off in a nice hot oven so they get really caramelized and beautiful like that. You can have them as they are. You can add them to your roasted turkey really platter. Nice. Yeah, exactly. That's mm. always juicy. That's the best thing about cooking up turkey legs, and that's why I love them so much. How that. long do you bake them? Uh, they take about 45 minutes to an hour, roughly, give or Man, take. So. so you can't have turkey, Elizabeth, without some gravy. That's uh, but the truth. By the way, this is Elizabeth Haskell for folks who don't <laughs> watch this show on a regular basis. Today, food contributor. Come on over, author. Um, and I know you like to celebrate Thanksgiving with a little, obviously a little food, but a little football as well. Honey, let me tell you something. Those old Miss Rebels. What am I supposed to say? Oh, good God. Hotty toddy. Hotty toddy. Hotty toddy. There you so are. So there we are. So, so the egg ball is always played on Thanksgiving afternoon, Thanksgiving evening. Um, so it's Mississippi State versus Ole Miss, and we have going to have a showdown this year. So as soon as the turkey's done, we're headed to the stadium. All right. So when All you're decide. doing gravy, you know, there are times when you may not bake your turkey. You may fry your turkey. Yes, so then you you're kind of messed up because you don't have anything to make your gravy yeah. with. Mm -hmm. So this is going to be your solution. We have some melted butter, and now we have our flour. We're making a roux. This is key. If you don't let this flour really cook, mm -hmm. it's going to be kind of pasty. You also want to make sure that you whisk, 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 whisk okay. to get all of those lumps out. And then... It should look like this when you're done? Well, yes, exactly. So then here, oh, and okay. then you, you start, it. once it cooks for a little bit, you you're going to add the broth. This is chicken broth. Okay. Now, the thing is, if you want to make it ahead, and that's why I love this recipe, because you can make it ahead. Mm -hmm. But if you decide to go ahead and roast it, great. Go ahead and add a little bit of those drippings in here, and that will really give it that wonderful flavor oh, as well. Elizabeth Haskell. There Thank we you. go, Thank boo. Thank you, Elizabeth. So good. Can we have a cocktail? Hotty toddy. Uh, yes, we can. Hotty toddy. Yes, we have today food contributor Alondra Ramos. What Thanksgiving dinner or tradition, should I say, first of all, do you look forward to most? Well, you know say? what? And I think this is going to sound like I'm sucking up, but okay. I actually love celebrating every year with you guys. And I was Aww. thinking about this last night. This is my ninth year oh my doing goodness. Thanksgiving. And it, I just think it's always such a joy such a privilege to be able to share our traditions with everyone well, that's we watching. You and we love you now. Oh, Plus, right. we have cocktails. Yeah, okay. <laughs> How do we do it? All right, so today we are making a cranberry I'm sauce margarita. Oh, that's genius. Yes, and Ooh. so you can use that cranberry sauce. My tip for this is definitely use the kind of whole berry or homemade, mm -hmm. like that great one that Priyanka showed us earlier today. Mm. Really fantastic. Mix that up. Mm. To this, we're adding tequila, of course. You can also do mezcal if you want something a little bit smoky. A little bit of Cointreau, triple sec, you know, the little orange liqueur. And some fresh, fresh lime juice. Do not use the bottled kind, please. Oh, please don't. Okay. I'll do it. Please don't. And then here's the tip. Use the metal shaker, and you want to shake shake, shake until shake. the outside is fully frosty. Shake, shake, That's shake. how you know it's ready. What do you think about this? This is the one Chanel? of the best drinks we've ever had. Oh, yeah. That's, That's really, really good. good. Okay. Okay. It's really, okay. really good. And it was super simple. <laughs> no, I so love this. Simple, and everybody's. You already have the cranberry sauce at the table, so you can enjoy this on Thanksgiving. But also, oh, that's and that sorry. sugar rim for the really whole weekend. The sugar, that sugar rim. Yeah, and we did a little sugar rim on that. And oh. you can do yeah. cinnamon if you want to make it even more Ooh, kind of fall. Now. A little pumpkin spice. No, oh, yeah. oh, press yeah. it up. Cheers, guys. Hey, love you. Love you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Love you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Love you all. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. All of these recipes just head to today.com slash food or again scan the QR code to sign up for a Today account, and you can save them for Thanksgiving. Let's but wait, wait, wait. There's more. Yes. Our all-star celebration continues next. We've got three more recipes, yes. another super side, and we saved the sweetest for last. Mm. Two great desserts. And then later, a shop all day that you don't want to miss. Okay. Uh, Eat and shop. Must have items if you're planning a holiday road trip. Third hour of today rolls right on after this. <laughs> Cheers. Yeah.
All right, we are back with more of our eighth annual. It feels like Thanksgiving. It's like a family reunion around here. Our all-star Thanksgiving with three more dishes for your table. Again, it sounds intimidating if you haven't done it. You just open up your phone, put the camera to it, and put it up against that little square there. It's a QR code, and you can get the recipe and save it for next week. All right, let's get started here. Chef and author of The Simple Art of Rice, Mr. J.J. Johnson. How are you today? Right, we're going to start with you. Love collard greens. Yep. So, so there's two things that have to always be on the Thanksgiving table. Okay. It's collard greens. Yes. And rice. That's yes. true. Okay. Facts. So... I know I'm famous for my collard green salad, but in my new cookbook, The Simple Art of Rice, okay. I do this black rice salad with collard greens in it. Okay. But first, look, y'all eating already. Come I on. Know, I'm like, put the cocktail But down. over here, okay. you got coconut dressing. So you got a little bit okay. of lime juice, okay. a little bit of white vinegar, some ginger, mm -hmm. okay? And then some honey. Okay. Okay, no, that honey don't want to come out, so we're going to leave that alone. But it's like a sweeter taste. Very sweeter taste. Yes. And black rice is good for you. So, so we eat good. You tell it to the people. Good, this is good. That's not what I was expecting. All so right. in this salad, you're going to have some cashews, some orange zest, some I have basil. A question. How do you cook black rice? Because your black rice is so good. Like, how do you do it? So black rice, you cook it just like you cook rice. Yeah. But what you need to know is that the texture is going to be like farro okay. or barley. Little, little and if you come to Field Trip, you know what the black yeah. rice tastes like yeah. at Field Trip. But mm. it's going to be nutty. It's going to be firm. And then you kind of add this dressing to it. Mm. You add the raw collard greens. These ain't your mama's collard greens. No, they're okay? not. Because I make spicy collard greens. It doesn't look like that. And you just mix this together. Phenomenal. And it's going to be really great. Sweet, spicy, creamy. Yeah. And healthy. And very healthy. And I like the texture that the, uh, the cashews add, too. That's great. That's nice. Delicious. Okay. Thank you, Jake. This is a win. All right. Next up, chef, author of Justice of the Pies. Yay. This is Maya Camille Broussard. Maya Camille, uh, this year I know you're thankful for your mom, who also works on your business with you. Yes, so what's, my mom. what's your message to her this holiday? My mom is a retired physician. So, oh, wow. you know, what's what's the best job to have next for oh, a second one. job <laughs> than to work for me? <laughs> <laughs> Helps you keep your costs down, though. Helps you keep, keep your labor costs down. Yes, What definitely. are we making? You know, um, so we are making a German chocolate bourbon pecan pie. Mm -hmm. Had me a bourbon. I mean, yeah, you know, we 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 love our you know our cocktails. There we do. And we love our cocktails and desserts. So uh, we are going to use an all butter crust, and you could get this recipe also in my cookbook, okay. Justice of the Pies. And then we set that aside, okay. and then we focus on our filling, which is eggs. Make sure you whisk the eggs first before you add in everything else, because if you don't, then your filling is going to be too far. So that's oh, our granulated sugar. Then we have dark corn syrup. We'll pretend okay. that comes out. <clears throat> oh, we only nice put it in, uh, <laughs> just dump it in there. Okay. And then we also have uh, chocolate syrup. And oh, you can make it, yeah. you know, from scratch, or you can store bar. It's perfectly okay. fine. And then chocolate. Yes. Okay. Store um, fudge. Oh, fudge. Fudge. Oh, and then that? for flavor, a bit of vanilla. And for even more flavor, salt. You know, salt always brings out the flavor in whatever you're making. We whisk that together. Okay. And then we're going to put in flour to thicken it. And then we fold in our pecans and our sweetened coconut plates. And then blend that all together. Right. Pour it into your pie shell. You have a beautiful. How long do you bake German that? chocolate bread yeah, pecan pie. Can you cut can you you taste this? Can you? Oh, can you oh, how long do you bake it? Can I get a little uh, we bake it for about 35 oh, minutes at 300. Jump. Yeah, see? That's jumpy. See? Okay. Yeah. Hey. Happy Thanksgiving to me. <laughs> Last but far from least, this is Hetty McKinnon. Hetty's the author of Tender Heart. It's Good. a cookbook about vegetables Good. and unbreakable family bonds as well. And Hetty, this recipe is great for families who might have a gluten-free eater like Dylan uh, in the mm. bunch. So tell us how your soy sauce brownies come soy together. Soy sauce brownies. Yeah, Never we're heard. making so soy that. sauce brownies. Not your traditional... Thanksgiving dessert, but okay. it's um. So we use soy sauce, but we use make sure you get the gluten free soy sauce or tamari. Okay. So the, what the soy sauce does is it adds you know a little bit of like salted caramel flavor. Okay. So first of all, well, we're just going to melt the butter and the chocolate. I mean that right there is enough. But yeah, the, that's the, the dessert in itself. The way right? you're doing it though for folks at home, you yeah. Got Double broiler. Oh. This stops the chocolate from freezing up. So y'all all know this because you're professional. <laughs> but for me, I'm like, wow. And this okay. is the easiest. Well, there's three bowls here, but it's virtually okay. a one bowl dish. So we, we've got the melted chocolate. Okay. We've got three eggs in here. I'm going to add that in there. And you know, I will say, because Dylan isn't here today, Thank she you. has been all, all season trying to find yeah, perfect desserts for yeah, yeah, yeah. her family that are gluten-free that still taste yummy. Yeah, so in here we've got almond yeah. meal, almond flour with some Ooh. cocoa powder. 
We've got some brown Chocolate sugar. So All gluten-free. Yeah. All gluten-free. And then we've got some vanilla extract. Okay. okay. And our secret ingredient, the soy, soy. sauce. Why soy? So the soy sauce gluten-free soy sauce. It yeah. adds this kind of, brings out the chocolatey flavor more. Okay. By the way. Adds that caramel flavor. I understand that at your at your house, after Thanksgiving, you have a tradition. You watch, what do you watch? We you, watch Friends. We watch, watch Friends. all the Thanksgiving episodes of Friends. <laughs> well, so, awesome. you, you remember the episode with the... Uh, yes, my, my your, favorite episode. <laughs> <laughs> JJ, Mike, Camille, Eddie, thank, Amazing. thank you all. Thanks to all of our chefs, by the way. Uh, happy, Thanksgiving. happy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. If you love these recipes, scan the QR code so to save them for next week. And stay tuned for even more of today's best Thanksgiving coming up next hour on Huda and Jenna. I'm like, where's my cocktail, my salad? Like, oh my all right. Up next, if you're traveling That's this hilarious. holiday season, don't miss shops all day. Products to make your life easier, whether you're driving or heading to the airport. We'll be right back. Morning and Shop All Day. We are preparing you for one of the busiest travel seasons of the year. These are products that will hopefully take some of the stress out of your trip. So check them out. How many times am I going to say QR code today? This is at least the sixth time. <laughs> okay, well, check it out. You know how to you do it. it. Shop sure today contributor McCohen Lobo is here to show us. Good morning. Good morning. All right, I've got some exciting yeah, news to share good. with you guys. Okay. So Shop Today has launched the official Today browser extension. What does that mean? What does that, that mean? means that you can save money across your favorite brands. So go to today.com slash savings to install Install the extension, okay. and then when you're shopping, you're going to get these codes and these deals that automatically Automated. apply at checkout. Wow, yeah, that's next level. It's free. Yeah, it's free, okay. and it's easy. And this is new. This is new, so make sure you get on it. And what's the website again? What's so go to today.com slash savings, install the extension, okay. and then when you're shopping, you'll get these codes and deals, and they'll apply automatically. And it's across all your favorite brands, what's, so definitely check it out. What's Ooh, there? Oh, there it is. There right it there. is. Yeah, yeah, okay. super cool. What's this all first right. product? This seems genius. For... All right, well, we're getting on the road again, so whether it's a short trip or maybe just a little trip to the grocery store, mm -hmm. we've got this four-pack of hooks. Look at how easy it is to put your bag, to put your coat, to put your water. You just put this on the back of a car You seat? put it on, uh, so according to the brand, it hooks onto most headrests, which makes it super easy. So again, if you're going to be traveling this holiday season, you want to keep that stuff off the ground. So this four pack is a must have. Can't beat that. One Can't of our colleagues that. is telling me on the, on the crew here that yeah. he has one. And he and he's obsessed with it, right? All right? Our next product, kind of a multitasker. What is this? Uh, guys, let's be honest. Yeah. Our trunks are probably the messiest oh, part terrible. of our cars. Exactly. It's because of the kids, though. It's because uh, of the kids. Yeah. We're going to blame the kids. Well, we're going to keep the kids organized with this organizer, I absolutely love all the different bins that it has. It has three large bins. You've got the pockets on the side. According to the brand, it is waterproof as well. It also has this detachable cooler, right? Which oh. is great. With the holidays coming up, That's put in right. your food this. and your drink, and then I you can just throw it in there. I need this for the trunk. Like, oh, for your trunk. everything just like goes That's in there. That's absolutely where you use it. And then yeah. guess what? It collapses down once you're done using That's it. That's smart. Yeah, this okay. is the way. Al Roker likes to say, ABC, <laughs> always be charging. <laughs> exactly. So if you're going to be taking a road trip, whether short or long, you want to make sure that you have a car charger. This one right here is clutch. So what you do is plug in that inverter right into the lighter adapter. It has oh. four USB ports. It has two standard plugs, which is great. If you're going to be traveling with kids, this is a must have. It's going to charge your phone, your tablets, all your devices, according to the brand. Nice. That's yeah. Okay. Ooh. Ooh. OK, so this is great also. Whether it's traveling to the airport or a long yeah, road trip, these nice. shoes right here are super comfortable. I love that you're lifting them. Don't they well, feel great? They're so light. 
excited. Yeah. Okay, well, they're available for this men and for women. They've got that outsole according to the brand, these yeah. elastic laces, which is nice. But feel the inside. It's all about oh, yeah. that faux oh, nice. shirling, which is so nice. And guess what? We've got what? a discount for you today. Okay. Make sure you check out Today25. Oh, that is the code for 25% off Hey Dudes entire website. So Next time, bring them yeah. in a 13. Yeah, and like a 13, I got you. Well, for you. Now, that's a nice little a gift idea for available for men and women. And, oh, this is a good And one. last but not least, yes. I think when you're traveling, you want to make sure that you keep your beauty routine yep. intact. Can you yes, feel girl. this satin yes. pillowcase? Yes, yes girl. <laughs> you got to maintain that hair. This is really soft. So according to the brand, this is great for the skin. Takes care of the skin, gets rid of those blemishes. Takes care of the hair because it eliminates that frizz. Comes yep. in a bunch of different colors. You can just pack it up, packs up nice and compact. But this is really great for taking care of so, your beauty routine on the road. Full disclosure, I didn't Tell know me. you were doing this today. I have two yeah. of these. You have two of these? I do. And what's your favorite thing about well, it? Well, first of all, it's soft and yummy. It's like yeah. a hug for your head. And then for your hair. A hug for your head. <laughs> and then your hair doesn't get all ratty. Well, and you don't have to worry about like wrapping it up. That's it. such a good point. You just go sleep. And it and makes a fine. great gift as well. So make there sure you that you check this one out thank as well. You. Thank Nicole, you. Thank you. Thank you. These are good. Always a pleasure. Right. Thank you, guys. And by the way, you can see all of these. Where can we see all of these items? <laughs> it's a QR code. That's right, a QR code. Or today.com slash shop. It'll be there too. We'll be right back. Tomorrow on the third hour of today, Aquafina live here in studio. Nice. Man. Coming up on Hoda and Jenna, HGTV, HGTV, Drew and Jonathan Scott. We will see you right back here tomorrow. Have a great day. Have a good day, everybody. Today, it is double the fun with HGTV stars and brothers Drew and Jonathan Scott. Plus, Marcus Samuelson and Melissa Clark whip up a couple of tasty Thanksgiving sides. And we're talking about Harry's new hairstyle. The pop star rocking a new look on Instagram, and it's got the internet divided. From Studio 1A in Rockefeller Plaza, so up, it's today right now, with Hoda right now, oh, oh. and Jenna. It all starts right now. Now. Here we go. Here we go. Hey, guys. It is Thursday. It is the 16th day of November. This time next week, guess where you're going to be? At our Thanksgiving table. That's right. Or no. else you'll be cooking. Or we'll be, be watching, watching the, the parade. Macy's Day Parade. So one week from today, mark your calendars. You'll be very busy. Also, there'll be a lot of football on. I can't wait. You know what I decided this Thanksgiving I'm going to do? What? I think I feel like all of our families come in and they stay for, you know, we have how many holidays is everybody together? So think Not about many. that for a second. Yeah. And then I spend so much of my time doing things like, oh, let me get that. Let me get that. Let me do this. Yes. Let me do this. My mom always says, why don't you just sit here for a minute? And I was like, oh, I will in a second, mom. But first, I got to get the thing. And we're out of eggs. And now we need this. Did, did so-and-so get what they needed? And you realize that in that short period of time. Yes. You're not sitting down. You're running around. You're going to stores. You're making sure this is done. You're you not to actually find this. You're not there. enjoying it. Yeah, you're not there. 
you're not physically. So this year is going to be different. Can I tell you something that just came to my mind? Mm -hmm. Is that for on my 40th birthday mm -hmm. happened to fall on Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. And because it was my birthday, mm -hmm. I allowed myself the pleasure of laying on the couch with my children watching the parade. Oh. I allowed, I, I still had to do things. I can feel but that. But I was much slower yes. because I was like, it's my birthday. birthday. Right. Somebody I, else can figure that out. I'm going to lay here and watch the parade. And I was very, you were very happy. happy. And very think, happy. it's like anyone's big day, their wedding day, whatever the day is. Yeah. You're spinning around and you're like, it's all happening you around it. you, but you're missing it. So just okay. just another slow it down. I'm going to. Okay. I'm going to do it. Yeah, let's it, do it. It's fun. Why not? Okay. Okay, somebody good. that I'm going to be listening to while I make my turkey, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. is not going to be any good, is mm -hmm. Harry Styles. And he's making some, some hair-raising headlines because he got a cut. He didn't just get a cut. He did a, he got a real tight cut. There is Mr. Harry Styles. His luscious locks are no more. By the way, I don't mind. Very handsome. I don't without. mind it. I would take it either way. Either way. Either way. Either way. And it shows you, he, he, first of all, he is a lovely human being. He's like one of the nicest and also most down to earth yeah. grounded people I think we've met. Yes. It's cool, yeah. But it shows you that hair matters but it doesn't matter that much. No, it doesn't. <laughs> no, no. Well, I think if you look like Harry Styles, it doesn't really well, matter. Exactly. But I mean, if I buzzed so... my head, it would be a different story. <laughs> I'm not going. No, Gavin. Did you just hear Gavin yell, do it? Gavin. She's not oh. doing it. Gavin, Go I'm not going to buzz it. All right. But he's not the only male celeb who okay. had a buzz cut. Who so else? Lenny Kravitz Ooh. went from long to short. Lenny Kravitz, again, equal. Equal, just like Harry. Handsome Harry's. man, so it don't matter. Sometimes when you're that good looking. And critical is the shape of the head. It's true. <laughs> because we actually don't know what our head shape is, you and I. Well, we know they're large. We know they're large, but we don't know, does it have a top? Is it like pointy? Is it flat? Is it, I have no idea. I think mine is sort of square. You do? Okay. But who knows? And we're never really going to find out because we ain't shaming We it. aren't. No, All right, so ain't. how about one of our favorite Chris's, Chris Evans? Oh. Let's see. Okay, either way. Either way. <laughs> Either way, either way. Chris Evans is very handsome. He's my favorite Chris. I know you like him a lot. Who's yours? Chris Pratt. Because of Maria. Okay, have you ever done a huge chop? I did once and it wasn't my own doing. I was young and, they, and the hair person, this, the hair stylist dresser, thought that my hair was kinky because it was damaged when mm. really it was just the way it grew. And so he thought that it would be a good idea if we just started a fresh. <laughs> So how fresh was it? It was real fresh. Were you kind of, you know what's hard when you're that age is I'm sure you were trying to a say. Boy. Then it was like, he's a, now you're, you're a boy. Because my name was not really recognizable as either gender. Well, I wasn't and going then, to say that. And then to have the haircut and the joker was not a help. I wore a joker, <laughs> not for that purpose, but you I did. wore it. And at that point. A lot of people wore chokers. Yeah, totally. So it wasn't. But the point is, I'm sure you were trying to express to him in your own 13, 14 year old way that that's just the way your hair grew, but he ignored you. And I also think I didn't say it very loudly. No. I'm sure I screamed it in my brain. Yes. And, it, and but on the outside, I was like, he's a grown up. He knows. You got to really kind of say your thing. How are we going to teach our girls <laughs> yes, to be to polite, say, but also brave. stand up for themselves? Yes. You don't want doormats. No. But you also don't want want rude kids. No. I, it's such a fine yes. line. You want them to stand up to grown-ups, but also in a And polite speak line. their truth. Yes. Okay. All right, so Beyonce. <laughs> <laughs> speak about somebody that is not scared to ask for what she wants, do what she wants. Beyonce was, of course, one of the biggest concerts of 2023. So we've been waiting for this. Her tour is now coming to the big screen. And, you know, Taylor Swift's uh, film. Con film is her concert straight on. As right. you went to the concert, that's the film. Yes. Beyonce's is different. It's more of a documentary slash concert, concert film. behind the scenes. So let's take a look. You are the visual baby. It's a new birth. I hope you feel liberated. But the renaissance is not over. Everybody. Oh my gosh. Come on. Come on. That's We have be got to book <gasps> a, a ticket to that.
Immediately. Okay, so for her 40th birthday, we all know during the concert, she asked concert goers to wear silver. She simultaneously, she brought silver back. Yes. Okay, but now for the LA premiere of her movie, she's asking fans to dress this way. Cozy opulence. Cozy opulence. So what does they that mean? They like seem a, like oxymorons, right? Because when you're cozy, some of us just wear our husband's T-shirts. You know who dresses in cozy opulence? Who? Jada Pinkett Smith. Oh, yes. Right? It's like a cozy yes. looking kind of yes. sweatsuit, yes, but, but it's, it's got bedazzled. great earrings and yeah. stuff. That's what cozy, that's what it is. Uh, yes, I wore it this morning. Yeah, you walk around in cozy opulence. Those are your slippers. Is that, I, they asked me to put my foot up like that. <laughs> but by the way, that is a cozy opulent slipper. It's it's furry inside. It's furry and soft, and I we, we did them on a segment. Bird I've slippers. had them, birdie slippers. Mm -hmm. I think, and the best part is they make me so happy. Because when just, I get to oh. work, I just put them on, and I don't know if that's inappropriate to walk around your workplace in a slipper. I think it's okay. But I'm fine. I'm okay, happy yeah. when I wear those. Look at that. Look at that. Look at that foot right there. No, please right on don't. The right. No, look at that foot. No, it's please next don't. to the makeup. No. Okay, I know. Wait, wait, wait. They asked me. No. Wait. People are doing their makeup, their lip gloss, and all that. That's what? where you eat your chips and such. I do. I do. I do. I'm sorry I put my foot okay. up like that. I was told to. Okay. By the way, one of my favorite things that I like to do is I love when there's good news to share. I love when <sighs> something great happens to somebody who I love. Oh. And some Something great happened to somebody. I love you guys. This young lady right here is a New York Times best-selling author again. Yep. Loves come first. Hit the New York Times best-selling list. This book was like a rocket ship, and it's no, it, it's, it does not surprise me in the least because the book is full of life lessons. By the way, I should point out that my daughter Haley read it before school yesterday. Herself, she read it, enjoyed it. Da -da -da. Hope wanted her own reading, okay. so she got hers later. And did she like it? She loved it. And did their mother like their it? Mother, no, their mother didn't like it. Their mother loved oh, it. So, so sweet. congratulations thank you, thank you. to Jenna Bush Hager. Thank coming you, up, thank you. Coming up next, we got a couple of new Christmas movies to tell you about. Plus, Dolly's about to drop holiday gifts for all her fans. That's all ahead on What's Poppin' right after this. Look who's here, pop culture expert and Bravo personality, but most importantly, our friend, yes. Darren Karp is here. She's got the hot stuff in her series. Yeah, it's called What Poppin'. Poppin'. All right, what you got? All right, ladies. I need you, Darren. Oh, okay, you need me, I need you. Here are the top five things just popping in pop culture okay. right now. Are you ready? Ready yes. for number What's five. number five? All right, number five, I feel like I have to say this clapping because it's got periods. Best. Christmas, Christmas ever. ever. It's officially holiday movie season, and this yeah. is a fantastic one. It stars Brandy, it stars Jason Biggs, Heather Graham, Wait, what? Matt Cedeno. It's a tale as old as time. Every Christmas, Jackie, who's played by Brandy here, yeah. writes a just seethingly too perfect Christmas newsletter about oh, her God, family those. and her friend. Her old, I know. It's <laughs> just like, those. it's like too Instagram perfect. And her old DIY. college friend, Charlotte, yeah. gets so jealous, makes her feel like a heel. And in a simple twist of fate, Charlotte and her family, who she's married to Jason Biggs in this, ends up on Jackie's doorstep oh. for Christmas. Take a look. Dear friends, family, and fellow Earth dwellers, life just seems to fly by when you're having a splendiferous time. Oh, is that? The Jennings Holiday Newsletter. It's the most absurd thing ever. I would love to show up at her house uninvited and to see the actual truth. Charlotte Sanders? Jackie Jennings? What are you doing here? Are you sure you put the right address in your phone? Of course I'm sure. Surprise! Grab your bags. There is plenty of room here at the end. 
Uh, you all have those whoa. friends. You all have those friends. So no. she wanted to pull back the curtain to see. Now if she when really she pulls did. it back, it looks pretty perfect it, with all those garlands. Well, she has got a hot husband, but it premieres on Netflix today. Okay. You're going to want to see it. It's okay. family so friendly. Fun. Number okay. four, take us down. Yeah, number four. This is a book that I've been devouring. How to know a person? The art of seeing I others love deeply. Me too. And being deeply seen. Uh, this is by David Brooks, as you were saying. It's one of my favorites. It came came out a few weeks ago, and it really teaches you how to disagree without being disagreeable. It's oh. kind of perfect for the holiday season when some of us are around our family members yes. and maybe have one too many debates around the Thanksgiving table. But he really teaches us how to foster deeper connections with our friends, our family, our coworkers. He talks about two, two different types of people. There's the diminishers, the ones who kind of bring yeah. you down, yeah. make you feel invisible. And then there's the illuminators, the one that light you up and treat you with curiosity. And yeah. he gives you little tips for treating others that you disagree with. with just an ounce of curiosity could kind of change your yeah. attitude towards like, them. Listen, okay. be curious. We exactly. know what we're ordering. That's a Thank good you one. It's a great book. Mm -hmm. It's my favorite. Um, okay, what's popping for number three? Okay, number three. This one's hilarious. Genie. This is a new original holiday comedy starring Melissa McCarthy, Alan Cumming, oh. Papa Esedeu. How do I what? know about this? What, what is happening Come here? On. It's, it's not out until November 22nd, oh, so don't okay. feel bad, but it's from our sister streaming service, Peacock. It's written by the same screenwriter who wrote Love Actually, oh. which is... Okay, thank you. It is a very good holiday movie. I've had debates with friends about no, this. And no, no. You wait, are at the right place love, at the right wait, time. Wait, who are your friends debating whether they're love They're not my actually, friends. They're my ex-friends. Thank no. you. Yeah. I'm sorry, but we are going <laughs> to diminish that yes. idea. Yeah, we're getting rid of those friends. Right. We're, okay. they're, they're toxic. Melissa McCarthy plays a genie who forges a friendship with Bernard, who drops the ball with his family, and so he wishes to have more time with them. And okay. she's the genie that's going to make it happen. Let's take a look. That's when I happened upon this old antique jewelry box. And then I rubbed it. Oh, oh my God. God! Who are you? I am a genie. <laughs> yeah, there you are. Your wish is my command. Okay. I wish I had my very own camel. <laughs> I wish I had large pizza, pepperoni, extra cheese. This is just a triangle of... Red bread. Go and try it. Wait an ever loving minute. <laughs> this is heaven. <laughs> oh my Streams gosh! On Peacock, November twenty second. Okay. Oh, you know what? Peacock is doing all the cool things. Yeah. What's number two? Number two. I'm so excited for this. This Friday, Dolly Parton, the patron saint of all saints, is coming out with her first rock album. We've been waiting for this. Rock star. This is her 49th solo studio album. Oh. So talk about just. I'm just blushing with just how successful she is. Yes. This is her first foray into the genre, and she collaborates with so many cool people, including her goddaughter, Miley Cyrus, on Wrecking Ball, yes. which I know you both love. Elton John, Debbie Harry, Pink, Mick Jagger, She's Paul gotten... McCartney, and Ringo Starr. Can Have you ever heard listen? of them? Can we listen? Let, let it be. Oh. Let's, let, let's take a listen. Oh, come on. Melissa Lewis. Oh, my God, I could cry. Me, too. It's chemical. It's chemical. It's chemical. So good. Oh. Oh. I feel like this is the Thanksgiving prayer that I that's been the answered Beatles for me. Beatles and Dolly, you really can't get better oh. than that. You really can't get better. All right, than take that. us to number one. Come on, number girl. one. I've been watching the Golden oh, Bachelor everybody. since day one, and and it is fabulous. Okay, America and me instantly fell in love with Gary. He's the 72-year-old hot widowed bachelor and i'm telling you everyone has fallen in love for weeks we've been watching him with these gorgeous bachelorettes oh, no, he cries Ev oh they cry we cry every episode is touching and filled with hope i mean there's very rarely drama which is so nice it's actual women supporting yeah. women <sighs> he's got his two finalists tonight he's got Teresa, who's been in a little bit of drama and then leslie who when she first met gary showed off her hearing aids and i was so happy so who do you think is gonna win I think Leslie's gonna take okay. it. That's my bet. Wait, right when's now. the finale? Finale is tonight, tonight oh. at eight o'clock. Remember, we've been we meaning were to watch meaning it. To. Guys, we uh, have to binge before. Can love we watch actually them all? and love is all around. Yes, us? yes it yes. is. Darren and we love Darren, you. Thank, thank you. you. Have a happy Thanksgiving. All right. Happy By the way, look who's popping in right now. Our pals Drew and Jonathan Scott. They've got all sorts of new projects, and we're gonna get the scoop. <laughs> <laughs> oh, whoa! <laughs> right after this. <laughs> Coming up Friday, actress, producer, and best-selling author Lauren Graham. Plus, Jenna and her sister Barbara hit the road to hang out with Ben and Aaron Napier. And director Taika Waititi gives us a peek at his new movie, Next Goal When. That's all Friday on Hoda and Jenna.
It all started with real estate and renovation projects on the Property Brothers. Now, these two are wildly successful entrepreneurs and TV personalities. We're talking about our good friends, of course, Drew and Jonathan Scott. Guys, good morning. Uh, Jonathan, look at you, engaged, <sighs> excited. I'm so grown up. You are so grown You know what I love what you said before we came to the, to, to the segment? You said, if you two had met 20 years ago, you're not sure if you would be together. Well, no, I mean, sometimes I think you go through your whole life that's why I like when they're talking about the Golden Bachelor yeah. earlier. I'm like, you don't know when you're young what you want. And we got to a point where we know what we want and it's each other. And it's been the most incredible experience to actually feel that love bounce right back at you. Wow. And they wanted Jonathan to be the Golden Bachelor, but <laughs> Zoe got in the way. Twice. I got asked twice to be the Bachelor. I'm like, guys, I'm not well, your guy. Speaking of bachelors, are you yeah. throwing the bachelor party? Uh, am I throwing the bachelor party? Is he party? the best man? Be. Yeah. As soon oh, as I know the details of when things are happening, I already have some things in the works in, in my head. So, yeah. My, our other brother, J.D., as well, he and, and me are going to do some good things. It, it better be escape rooms, food, and theater. Is, yes. Ooh, that sounds better. good. Is your wedding going to be a big to-do, or are you guys going to keep it kind of tight? No, I think we want to keep it pretty intimate. Intimate. You know, we, frankly, we just want to throw a kick-ass party. That's, That's all you yeah. want. And they do have, throw good parties, yeah. 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 Oh, yeah. yeah. We had, Zoe and I have created our own shirts whenever we host a party. All of our, our team wear shirts that say, Z and J, we like to party. And people actually think that's an event company. Yeah. Z and J, we, we like throw, to party. Why don't y'all start that? Maybe we Go should. into business We're announcing together. here, everybody, that yeah. we're about to start now. No, they, they have their kids, like, the, the Halloween or birthday parties. It's the most epic thing. So Linda and I are like, this is easy. I never have to plan a party because yeah. we just, just crashed that. We have 309 um, kids at our party last week. Wait, 309, 309 kids? From where? How do y'all know that many? Kids. Well, it's all the kids. Friends. We always open it up to all the siblings of, of the okay. our kids' classmates. And yeah. So, yeah, we had. How do you? People. What do you do with 300 children at a? Well, it was, sorry, it was half adults, half children. So 300 okay. people. But we uh, we just have a great time. We had a dance floor. Well, we they had have like eight castles. bouncy castles and like it, it's it, it's oh, literally like you're like going to the circus. To do. Was yeah. this a Halloween fiesta? Yeah. 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 Wow. And did you take Parker yourself? We did. Oh, yeah. So I don't know if you've ever heard of the 80s uh, Japanese animation Totoro. So it's the Totoro's little creature. Parker was the little creature. And then oh. I play the four-year-old uh, little girl. And then Linda <laughs> plays the six-year-old girl. So. Oh, my gosh. How is Parker, by the way? Parker is amazing. Oh. He's a sweetheart. He's, he's now walking, running. So I'm oh. getting my steps in, chasing him down. Look but he's a little, uh, he's a little sweetheart. Oh, I love and that. And he copies everything. So if I'm like, ugh, then you just hear a little, ugh. <laughs> <laughs> He loves well, guitar as well. Yeah. I, oh. I know. You, you play? A little bit. I play a little bit. But it's funny. When he first got his little mini guitar, because he watches me every morning, I try and strum a little for him. I grab the pick off of the neck, yeah. and then I strum. He gets his guitar, and the first thing he did is reach over and go like this, and then go like There's this. There's no pick on his There's guitar, no, but no, he, he does just, it. He, he just, just does, does it. How cute is that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, oh it does show, does show you that kids watch everything. Every single So you guys are super close. What were holidays like growing up in y'all's household? Oh, my God. Bing Crosby, Nat King Cole, caroling. We would decorate early. Not going to lie. Zoe and I put up our, our Christmas stuff last yesterday. So we're officially set for Christmas. By the way, <laughs> me too. Because I felt Jen like this, it's earlier than I normally do it. Not my tree, but other things. Because we need it, right? Yeah. yeah. We need goodness. Yeah, How we close do you guys do. live to one another? We're about, I mean, depending on traffic, yeah, 25 to 35 minutes. Um, but it's it's nice, too, because our parents have moved to town. And so right now they're, they're spending time with us and spending time with John and Zoe until well, we're renovating their house. So once we're done their house, they're going to be living right in the middle between the two. And we're all going to go caroling us. together. <laughs> yeah. Wait, do you all live in you, Las Vegas still, or you've moved? No, no we're LA. in L.A. Okay. Yeah, oh, yeah. you're in L.A. Okay. Yeah. By the way, how cute is it that your parents are moving and you guys live 20 minutes away and everyone's yeah. right What there. about your other brother? J.D.'s in it's Vegas, crazy. too. So he comes out and visits, and then we try and get out to visit him as well. So Okay, right. well, you guys are super busy yeah you have multiple shows yeah do you did you ever it, and envision like this empire that you were building? Mm -hmm. not, not this, not the way it looks today, because we always knew, like John just said, there's something, we're meant to do something big. I don't know what that is. I want to be an actor. He wanted to be a magician, but we knew it, entertaining was a part of it and helping people was a part we're of it. We're overachievers. And so, but to, to get to a point now where, you know, our production company, we host uh, four shows, but we produce another 13 shows on top of that. That's amazing. Um, and we manufacture 10 and a half thousand products. Our whole goal is to try and create content and create products that make life better at home. Period. Well, you're so loved. They always they always said at People Magazine, every time you guys are on the cover, it's like a huge seller. Sold. There's something about you guys <laughs> together. You guys are... The airbrushing. Is it, you're launching a kind of a social hub, a new kind of website. Tell us about that. Yeah, drewandjonathan.com. I mean, for years and years and years, we've learned a lot when it comes to real estate, renovation, design, buying and selling.
their homes. Oh. We try and find ways to inspire people in their home, and we just wanted to have somewhere, a destination for people to come to, and the, the editorial that we have on there, behind the scenes of the shows, and just a lot of our, our history, too, and, and our traditions for the holidays and things like that. Anybody, no matter what their situation, will go on the website, they'll be inspired by the stuff they read, and then they can actually buy the stuff that will improve their home. Oh, right. amazing. You get it there, too? Yeah, oh. it's a funnel yeah, into all kinds of great content and great commerce. How oh, cool, cool is that? Okay, Drew, y'all are uh, sticking around, Jonathan, because yeah. we're about to beat you in a game. <laughs> we're about to Good beat luck. you. We're going to uh, play. Remember we're teaming up. The twins versus the twins. We in got a, it. In a game of don't, <laughs> don't look, look back. Uh -oh. Right after yeah. this. We don't play that pity game, guys. Oh, yeah, don't worry. And Jonathan Scott and since they're always up for a little friendly competition, we wanted to ta challenge these two to a game of Don't Look Back. <laughs> and our girl Donna is going to host Toast the yeah. Pool. I don't know how friendly this is going to be. No, it's, it's not, not going to be friendly at all. We're all oh, competitive. We're warming up these yeah. elbows. <laughs> okay, so here's how it's going to go. Hoda and Jenna, you guys will be first. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, Jenna, you will come stand on this platform. Okay. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Jenna. Hoda, you'll, you'll, be, get them. you'll be giving Good the clues. Jenna, you'll be guessing. Yeah, don't you you'll worry. What's the category? In honor of Drew and Jonathan's visit, your category is. Movies or TV shows with the word home, house, oh, or some sort of we dwelling in the title. We got okay? it. We got let's it. go. Let's go. It's going to pop up. You're going to give clues. You're going to guess. 45 seconds mm -hmm. on the clock. Are we ready? Uh huh. Let's go. go. Home Alone. Go. Next. Um, I've got to fix my home house. improvement. Yeah, good. Oh, that crazy. It's like that frat house. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, oh, oh, uh, uh, animal house. Uh, oh, I said, you keep going, keep going, keep going. It doesn't matter. Okay. Oh, <laughs> not little data, but big papa. No, <laughs> uh, it's the opposite of papa. Big mama's house. <laughs> yeah, good. Let's go. Uh, not half empty. Half full. Um, oh, house said, is full. You said the word. Half full. First. Full house. Yeah, go. Let's go. Really good. Um, okay, uh, pass. Next one, next one, next one. Let's go. Okay, the opposite of big, <laughs> small, <laughs> little, yeah, little house, uh, yeah. little house on the prairie. Yes, uh, yes, no. subtle, yes. Subtle. yes. <laughs> Come on, I got little house on the prairie. Get that one. Let's get it. Let's get it. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, very good. It was so just here's how it's gonna one. work. You guys have two, five like, to beat, so you need to get six in order to win. Drew, you'll be giving Jonathan the clues to guess. Don't worry. Wait, are you cool? You we'll, good? we'll see. We'll see what twins share brain. What's to be? So, okay. Okay, so in honor of Hoda and Jenna, your category is movies or TV shows about making TV shows. Oof. Oh, oh man. Real right. simple. Way to make it real simple there. Are we simple. ready? 45 seconds on the clock. All right. It's and okay. go. J just okay. Uh, okay, so, okay. Uh, she was, uh, what was it, a news anchor? This is from the, the late 80s, early 90s, somewhere like that. Uh, the not color, color, uh, uh, not black. What's another color? White. No, dark color. Dark color. Uh, uh, brown. Yes. First name that. Yeah. This is tough. What? 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 <laughs> this is a, a sitcom from the uh, the oh, 90s. Oh, Murphy Brown. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Good job. Yeah. Nice. Uh, okay. This is Faster, Jennifer Faster. Aniston. Uh, uh, morning show. Yeah. Yes. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, this is uh, Will Ferrell, and it is uh, <laughs> F. Hughes, uh, San Diego. Oh, uh, uh, Ron Burgundy. Uh, no, the legend of Ron Burgundy. The, what's it called? Uh, he is the you know, we'll news anchor, that. We'll anchor, that. anchor man. Yeah. yeah. It says the legend of Ron Burgundy. Uh, this is where we are right now. This is the Today Show. Yes. Uh, oh. What? I got three. Oh, I, I got three. That was picked tough. the 
wrong partner. Oh, okay. I guess. By the way, your twin brain is better than our twin brain. I've got to say, Murphy Brown was a hard. It was a hard. Murphy Brown. Thanks a lot. Murphy Brown was a hard one to begin with because that was. But my dance moves were better, right? Wallow. Yes. 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 All right. right. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Coming up next, we're going to help you plan your Thanksgiving menu. Marcus Samuelson, Melissa Clark, they're going to show some all-star sides. Coming up after this. Today we are celebrating our eighth annual All-Star Thanksgiving extravaganza. And right now we are going to focus on the best part of any holiday table, the side. The side. We are so happy because here with us is our pal, Chef Marcus Samuelson. He's the owner of the new restaurant, Metropolis. And we've got Melissa Clark. She's a New York Times food columnist, the author of Dinner in One. We're happy to have both of you. Don't forget, guys, scan the QR code right below me and you can get these recipes. So, Marcus, yes. you are going to make us some Brussels sprouts. We Brussels Brussels sprouts. Sprouts. We love Brussels sprouts. Yeah. Yes. Imagine Brussels sprouts. They were kind of out for a long time. Yes, they were and out. Now, now they're, they're back. In. Now they're back. They're back. But they're back. Crunchier and more delicious mm. than ever. So, we're just going to take olive oil. Okay. A little bit here on the tray as well. Oh, the parchment. And we're going to put them down. We're going to actually roast them in the oven for about 20 minutes on high heat so they get really nice and crispy. Right? So do you put any other spices on them? I am going to put going other to. spices on them. Okay. But you do going to let you they get out of the oven or no? We're going to do that right now. Right. We're going to okay. put them here on the tray. We're going to put a beautiful spice. We can mix them up like this too. This is called Berbere. This comes from Ethiopia, from my home country. Yummy. I like that. And it's that's the cool thing with, with Thanksgiving, garlic. right? You can, garlic. the sides can really be the star and whatever background you have, you can really put that into your sack. So we're going to put them in here, just like that. Toss them around put and them then lay them face, lay them down, face, face down. down so they Got get it. nice and crispy. Okay. We're going to roast them for about 20 minutes on really high heat. Okay. And here comes the good stuff. This okay. is the good stuff. So here, yeah. we're going to put in some red onion and shallots. Yummy. Peanuts, peanuts. because we're building textures Ooh. in these sides. Ooh, right? I really like crunchy, it. crunchy, crunchy, beautiful. Look, you put your, look how you do it with your hand. You're not even just a little bit like that. Right? Yeah. Just his fingers. Yes. A little bit like, uh, you know, you get this crunch from the peanuts. It's going to be really delicious. And then we're going to add in yes. a little bit of rosemary, some fresh herbs. Beautiful. But the key here, mm -hmm. I'm just going to put some in there too, is actually the maple syrup. Yes. We knew it. We're we going to caramelize. And some... You know, What's can that? I use balsamic vinegar? You can use balsamic vinegar or sh sh share vinegar. It's okay. Oh, vinegar. Does it make, is it the same difference? A little bit different. Rice vinegar. Rice you can use rice vinegar as well. Look at that beautiful crunch. Okay. All we're going to do, these uh -huh. are roasted. We're going to dump them in here. So you get a really nice crunch. These, it's all about textures and flavors, right? Yes. So now you have the berbere, you have the peanuts. And you, but we're not done because we're gonna have <laughs> pomegranate. I love pomegranate. I love pomegranate. Look at that. Garnish, right? 
Makes it look festive. Makes it look very fast and crunchy. It adds a and different sweet. texture. Nice and sweet and juicy. Taste that. Thank you. Okay. okay. Thank you, Marcus. Thank you, Marcus. Melissa, taste I don't no, got one. Marcus! No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, share. Yeah, share. Exactly. Well, do you want to bite first, Melissa? No, no, no. I got, we got we're going to eat, yeah. eat straight from the big thing. All right. Marcus, <laughs> heaven. Marcus. All right. Delicious. Oh, those are so beautiful. Easy. All right. Crunchy. Melissa, All take right, us so to this gonna, dish. What are you making? I'm making mashed potato casserole. Here's the thing. Mm. We, we love no, a casserole. We love, love mashed potatoes. And nobody likes to mash potatoes mm. at the last minute. You can mm -hmm. do this entirely ahead. Okay. And I'm flavoring it with, so I've got some red onion here, some olive oil in the pan. And I'm going to caramelize these red onions. Actually, it's not that hot. So I can see why you use your fingers. Mm -hmm. A little bit of thyme. Mm -hmm. And we want to get these really brown until they're really sweet, right? Because the onions are going to add sweetness and okay. they're going to add a little texture. Like Marcus said, it's all about the texture. Yeah, okay. texture. Okay. And we're going to cook them down until they're like this. Right? Oh, yeah. And they're jammy. And so mm -hmm. I've got my potatoes. Your potatoes, you can cook them ahead. Just boil them. I like to use russet potatoes, but Yukon Golds are good. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, here's the thing. You want to add... Everything. Look at the, look yeah, you want to add all this in two oh, like while this. you're look mashing. That Is that butter. soft butter right there? It's got to be soft mm -hmm. butter. And right. then parsley, you want to dump that. That's sour cream. Yes. It's cream. got yes. a sour cream. And, I mean, it's like this the This is like what's in a this great baked like, baked potato. Exactly. Yes. It's almost like twice baked potato. Yeah. Exactly. And it is twice baked because yeah. you, well, you boil yes. twice cooked because you're boiling and baking them. Mm -hmm. And then and now, this is, you've got to put oh cheese yeah. in any what casserole. Kind of so on. that's Gruyere, but you could use cheddar. You could use Look at Melissa with this fancy, I with the fancy, like I we are cheddar. We just like simple cheddar folks over here. I got to tell you, Gruyere is one of my favorites. It does have a nutty flavor. It does have a nutty flavor. Right? And so you want to mash it really well. You'll see. You're converted. And let's pretend I mashed it really well. That's nice. I Keep mashing it. Okay. Okay. He's going to be my sous chef. I love it. Could you put this in a food processor? It's too much. It's no, gonna be too it's going to be gluey. It's going to be too gluey. Okay. No, okay. Don't act like I know. I know. Okay. I know. No, but you know what you could do? You could do a mixer. No, you could do a hand mixer. Like a okay. hand mixer yes. with cream. Yes, do no. a hand mixer. Yes, We're doing you can. This. You can Your daughter will help you out because well, you guys you cook together. Yeah, we could do a hand so mixer too. Well, yeah. I love that you're doing this so, for me. Yeah. Right. Okay, now you this is important. So for the topping, you want that crunchy crunch. And all it is is it's melted butter, breadcrumbs, and then Parmesan cheese. Mm -hmm. Mix it together. Oh, two cheeses. Salt, by the way, salt. Yes. Salt, pepper on everything. I'm dying right and now. And so, yeah, two this cheeses. Is my favorite type I'm of dying right now. It's, it's nice, so right? good, right? Dying. You bake it at 400 for 30 minutes. You put mm. the breadcrumbs right on top. Delicious. Mm. It's so easy. Melissa? Do the Could you thing. add a little extra cheese on top? You know what? Anytime there's a opportunity to add cheese, mm -hmm. I will add Do cheese. It. <laughs> Do it. Can I get in here? You yes. get in there. Get in there, Marcus. Marcus it is. You're going to die. And get delicious. Ready. Right? Mm. I know. Because it's mashed potato casserole. Cream. Beautiful. Isn't that beautiful? Mm. Mm. Don't double dip, Jenna. Mm. Don't. I'm, I'm watching you. Don't I, 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 don't. <laughs> I am tempted to make this uh -huh. myself. And you can sure. make it ahead. I am tempted. Take mm -hmm. the whole thing ahead and Love then it. just pop it in the oven. Love oh my gosh, it. so it's good. amazing. Right. Both of y'all are so talented. And really I'm going to come to your new Thank restaurant. You. Please. Please. Yes. I'm going to invite you because you. you live close to yes, there. Yes, we so. both want to go. We want to go. I want to go yeah. too. Two well, different days. Two <laughs> different days. I don't want I don't want the customer to be like, like two different days. I don't feel like the two of you can be in the restaurant at the same time. Well, we get, and we're going to join. So the three of us. I'm inviting myself. For these recipes, go to today.com slash food if you need some ideas for your Thanksgiving menu. Scan the QR code by Marcus. Uh, sign up for a today account. You can save for your favorite recipes. Guys, thank you. This was so much fun. Happy Thanksgiving. Thank you. Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. Coming up next, Bobby's mm. Best for Less. She's got exclusive nice. discounts on her so four job. favorite beauty Cheers. brands. Coming up. This is insane. This is yeah. amazing. Oh my God. Right?
You know what it's time for? It's time to treat yourself to a little pampering. Today, contributor and our pal Bobby Thomas is back with her best, best for last. And y'all, she's got incredible exclusive discounts just for you. And you can get them by scanning that QR code on the screen. Bobby, Bobby okay. can we start with comfy cozy? Because that's all Obsessed. we want this time of year. Okay, like I said, I get I don't get anything out of this, not a dollar, but I get to tell people here what I love. And there is a brand called Jambies. Their tagline is performance oh. in activewear. Oh gosh. So performance in activewear. I am in activewear. In activewear. Ooh, I love in active that. And not look moving. behind you, by the way. This okay, is like. Okay, wait. Come here. Come here. Mush in uh, real life. No, if you felt this right now, you'd crawl. <laughs> it's like being in a blanket. You just want to crawl Feel inside. This. It's unisex. <laughs> so him, her, but get yourself on your list first. Yes. This isn't, wait, now, by the way, this, soft. feel that. It's soft. so soft. Their signature, it like feels like butter. I can't believe it I'm really saying that. It really is so soft. <gasps> the, po the boxers with pockets, pockets are what made this brand yes. a brand because yes. guys can lounge at home even if friends stop by and you're watching and it's a unisex, football game. Yeah, right? It's unisex. There's so many colors. The house hoodie, the I long jambies. Oh Everything God. is so soft. It's oh. amazing. Okay, okay. Let's, trash let's move on. This is your very favorite foundation. Well, I have a lot of favorites, but I will say Air. this is kind of oh, a secret airbrush. that I've been warning. When you need coverage, and sometimes you're like, but I don't want to feel goopy. Yeah. This is light as air. Luminous okay, is okay. Luminous is a brand that does the airbrush makeup, but right. they've come oh, up with license. technology. What? And I'll show you. You're supposed to spray it on the brush. But if you knew how light this was and yeah. what it was covering, it's like a it's like a cloud of air. So I have it on today. I mean, your skin. By the way, is I was going to say whatever okay. you're doing, Thank you. this is the thing to your keep doing. Your skin is beautiful. So I have a little scar right now. I have some hyperpigmentation, and when I don't want to feel gooped, you get the most amazing. By the way, this set I should tell you, Jambies. We were so excited. It's 50% off. Oh, what? I forgot to say that. I know. I keep forgetting because I don't and even care. And what about Lu Luminous? They're going to sell it regardless. So Luminous is 50% off. Too. And they have all shades for all skin yeah. types, right? Yeah exciting this is very I get to like tell them I love this and then I hear the brands like oh we want to do 50 they're that's gonna sell amazing. out so okay. don't listen to us okay, okay. now this is Another one of your brands. favorite skin brands I really like this brand I like a lot of skincare I'm such a beauty geek things. ever is all about skin 30 plus they uh -huh. really think what? about how your okay. hormones no, impact things. your skin <laughs> It's a clean brand, and they have some amazing 50% off oh. these select items today. So look, your feel these that. capsules Ooh, right here, capsule. this is their patented biocomplex uh, um, mm. active. Mm. And what you do, it's the perfect dose. When you travel, instead of having to bring the jar, you pull out how many One, days you two. need. It's amazing. <laughs> this, uh, <laughs> this serum is their best-selling serum. You love Jenna. And two masks. So I asked them for some of my favorite formulas. The capsules are a more concentrated version of the serum that I think smooths Just your feel skin. my face. It feels so good. It's like, it's like, and also you can picture makeup gliding yes. on after you put yeah. that on. Okay. I feel like I have the best job ever. So you like, do. I love this. Okay, yeah. let's move um, over to this department. Oh, yes, and then Jenny Patinkin, can I tell you, this is, is a this? fellow female who's an amazing beauty expert. Okay. She put her own website together. I mean, honestly, I wish I could get my stuff together like her, but she really has some of the best Would beauty tools. Would you explain tools. what some yes, of these do? Yes, please. A roller for your face that's mini that you can put in that's your bag. That's so what you put under your eyes Deep or whatever. Depop anytime. One of my absolute favorite things on her site that is why I went to her, solid brush soap. I know everybody Wait. doesn't want to wash their right. makeup oh, brushes. brushes. Look at her. She's like, oh, it's well, like, if you two of us are washing our brushes. Do you want to know how to keep your skin good? Wash your brushes oh, and your face. And look, we're we're showing oh. you. You know, when you oh, wash you your brushes. Yes, when you okay. wash your brushes. Also, wait, forget it. There's so much I can say, but you know what's so cool? What? Friendly. Bless you. Oh my gosh. This is recycled. <laughs> feel this. <laughs> I, I know. I'm wait, like, can I feel it? It's recycled plastic. That's like, wait, feel this. It feels like it feels like plastic bristles and other eco-friendly options. Jenny. I adore you. I hope you go to her okay, site. Okay, wait, what's this? Off. What's this? These are cryofacial things. Cryofacial. The, so you yeah, freeze, freeze them. them. Freeze them. We thought they looked like a pipe. I, these are and, great and gifts wait, can I ask, for the what's holidays. This thing for? That's to get the hair out of your brush. Oh, she has so cleaner. many, like, and lastly, she's like, what oh, this is. Brush no, 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 what's, what's, this? what's this? This is where you roll the oil off your nose. Oh, oh. love it. Love yeah. it. Try By this. the way, okay. Yes. Um, um, okay, we love yeah. you, Bobby. And they may collect a commission on any products. Yeah. <laughs> Go for it. That's yeah. true. But you can also shop at it today.com slash shop. And as All we good. said, we may collect a commission. Oh, we'll be back right after this. Great job, Bobby. Bobby. We love you. We love you.
We're so happy you watched us today. By the way, a new episode of the Read with Jenna podcast is out That's today. Right. I sit down with best-selling author Helen Ellis. She's hilarious. We talk about relationships. We laugh. Just scan that QR code or search for Read with Jenna wherever you get your podcast. Wait a minute. She's a best-selling author, and so are you. New York Times, baby. Mm-hmm. Tomorrow, author. Lauren Graham is with us. Plus, Barbara and I catch up with Ben and Aaron Napier. We go to Laurel, Mississippi. And the director behind this new movie that you got to see is called Next Goal Wins. Taika Waititi. Oh, I can't wait to see that movie. Okay, you guys, it's Thursday, one week from Thanksgiving, and tomorrow is... Hi, everybody. Good morning. Welcome to today. Every day. We are adding to the star power in our studio. The biggest names, only on today. See, we're coming to this early, right? Everybody, it's today. Like I won the lottery. How do you feel at this age, this stage? Liberated. We're just getting started, folks. Anal stuff with us now. The boys are back in town. The boys are back in town. It's a miracle. It's a miracle. This has been fantastic. Everything and everyone you're talking about, only on today. Welcome to today. So happy to see you guys. Would you like my boost? Yes. Back, here we go. But sometimes we just do things to help. That's our Hoda. Happy birthday. We got an awesome crowd, y'all. treasure trove. Yeah, it's just all kinds of, this is fun stuff. I could get lost in this all day. This is the rehearsal space? This is the rehearsal space. This is where, you know, we've pretty much got this set up as we would set up on our stage at a show. It's like a playhouse, I imagine, for a musician. You come in here, guitars and drums and whatever else you need. Yeah, it's a candy store a little (laughs) bit. So, and it's it's a place to put all that stuff, you know, and, and have it out and, you know, oh yeah, let's grab that and see what this does, you know. And then you might find a hit song, just grabbing things off the wall. Well, that's the hope. You know, that's the hope. But also the hope is just that, you know, you get to make the, make the sounds that give the vibrations that make it feel like the right thing, you know. Baby. No one oh, finds those vibrations quite like Chris Stapleton. This might sound strange, but... On his latest album, the 45-year-old reaches back to his earliest days in Nashville, long before the world knew his name. The t- title track, Higher, is, what, what year is it? It's 22 years old, 23 years old. And that's some, one of the, that was, song was on the first demo session I ever did when I moved to town as a songwriter. So I wrote that song by myself, and, and it's been hanging around ever since. So, so that's 2001. You've yeah. just come to town, your first demo. Yeah. So that's been sitting there waiting to be something for a couple of decades. How do you decide when to pull that one off the shelf and put it in an album? Well, that one's pretty... Uh, high level of difficulty as far as uh, singing goes and um, for me maybe not for somebody else. You're up else, there. But yeah. Some of those notes. <laughs> and uh, I don't know I, I think I was probably afraid of it for a long time and my wife was, would always would always push for that song and she was like you should try that and I was like I don't, I don't know if I have it right now. I don't know if I have that one anymore. You know because I, I wrote it when I was 23 you know like and you get to be in your 40s you're like oh, maybe I don't have what I used to have <laughs> but I've been working with a really uh, great vocal coach named Rob Stevenson, who has helped me really, you know, not only get back some of the things that I thought I didn't have anymore, but find some other other range that's well, really nice. So where we cut that song is about, it's at least a step, maybe a step and a half higher than it was when I did the demo. In, oh, is that right? So wow. you know, it was a little bit of a, you know, like a challenge to myself to try to do it, I think. So, um, and that one, that one was, you know, little bit of a battle to get but we got it you've got range with this thing that extends your range well it's (laughs) yeah it's uh that's me on a good day (laughs) stapleton taking that one-of-a-kind voice even higher question i think i've never asked you or talked to you about is when you first realized your voice was special or different? Was there a parent or a music teacher or somebody who said, because your voice is so distinctive, 
Well, my parents always told me I was special and different, as any good parent would, you know. But um, Was it early in your life? Was it when you got to Nashville? What did people say, hmm, there's something different about him? I, I always sang, so that was always like one of, one of my things that I would do. I think at some point people only maybe regard it as special or something when you start to have some kind of notoriety with it, you know. Mm. Like, otherwise, you're a dude that sings, you know. Like, there's lots of people that can sing, you know. Well, the road rolls out like a welcome night. I don't know anybody who sings like you. In other words, the way that voice comes out of that beard well, that takes, is different. I think that that maybe takes, uh, even when I moved to town, if you listen to things from when I moved to town, I'm not the same singer. You know, I spent a lot of time trying to be other people. You know, like, uh, I love Vince Gill. I've, I've, I've tried so hard to be Vince Gill and sound like Vince Gill. There's lots of lots of recordings, of demo recordings of me, like, wishing I was Vince Gill or, you know. <laughs> um, but I'm not, I'm not any of those people. And, and eventually, you hopefully through all those influences and um, also focusing on what it is that you do, um, you find out what that is and then you put that out there and, and that's if that's some something special that people think is special, that's great. Stapleton found his voice for good in 2015 with his Grammy-winning debut solo album, Traveler. In the eight years since, he has earned eight Grammys, won 15 Country Music Association awards, and most recently was named the Academy of Country Music's Entertainer of the Year. In February, another milestone for Stapleton, when he was invited to stand alone on one of the world's biggest stages. What is the level of nervousness going into the Super Bowl uh, anthem? Terrified, exponentially beyond belief. <laughs> but the national anthem is a hard one yeah. for any singer, I don't care who you are, on a number of levels, because you can be immortalized for really screwing it up, or you can do a passable, serviceable job, and everybody's like, all right, cool, he, he got it right. Or, you, you know, hopefully you get something beyond that. But just to get through it, if you get through it, there's, there's this, your shoulders drop and, and you go, okay, I didn't screw any of that up. I don't have to hear about it forever. I, I, you know, there's no, I didn't fall down or, you know, there, it, it's, a, it's a lot of eyes on that song and a lot of judgment on that song if you, if you get it wrong. So I might have worked on that more than I worked on anything <laughs> to do uh, for any television performance ever. But I was very nervous. I had a sinus infection that day. So I didn't do, I shot away from some things that I might have done mm. as, a, as a singer that day. But whoever, what well, really the power of that, after I watched it, and I didn't, I don't like to watch things back, but people were like, man, you should really go watch it. Go watch it. Whoever did all the edits with the coaches and the, yeah. the guys on the, on the ship and the, and, and the fly, the, it, was a, it was a really brilliant bit of editing in my mind that really made it feel maybe more powerful than it would have, you know, with just me doing it. Were you aware afterward that the Eagles head coach had tears coming down his face, that Jason Kelsey was choked up and that you had a role in that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I was aware after people were like, oh, you made, you know, you're making people cry. I was like, oh, okay, good. I'm gonna go watch the game. <laughs> and, you know, I was, you know, there's a lot of coming down off of something like that where you're just like, all right, I, I did it. I did it, I, I did that thing. And the whole of a prayer. And now the debate is Whitney Stapleton, the best Super Bowl anthem of all time. So well, I'll, I know you won't I'll weigh in on I'll that. I'll defer. <laughs> this is the chair that I've sat in for every record that we've made, but it it was in my parents' uh, little kitchenette, but I always have carried this chair with me. I moved to town with this chair. And so I sit in this chair anytime I'm um, making records and I'm, and I'm sitting down, sometimes I'm standing up. But if I'm sitting down in a, in a creative capacity, this is the chair, so. What's the significance of it to you? It's a comfortable chair. <laughs> that, <laughs> but, uh, so, that's where it ends. <laughs> well, that's the main part. As, as I get older, but um, it, uh, you know, 
I like to have little things with you that, that you carry with you through time. And I think those things inform what we do in ways that maybe you can't completely understand. But uh, if you have those little bits with you while mm-hmm. you're doing it, uh, whether it's a thing or a mentality or whatever it is, I think that that's good. I think that's a good thing. So that's, it's that's familiar. It's home. It's familiar. It's home. Yeah. yeah. It feels Good. comfortable. Stapleton also finds the comfort of home standing next to him on stage. Sing my Sarah, halo. He and his talented wife, Morgan, who met as young songwriters and now share five children, write, produce, and perform together. Broken halos that used to shine. White Horse is the hit that's out right now, yeah. first single off the album. What is that song about exactly? And is it true that when you ran it by Morgan, as you do everything, she was like, I don't know. I don't well, know that's, that, yeah, that song's the, the, the reverse of higher. It's just like I would bring that one up because I <laughs> like rock. I like guitar licks and stuff. That's, yeah. that's how I hear things. I, I don't think of songs as lyrical things. or uh, I, I, It takes me so long to hear lyrics in a song. I want to hear all the other stuff first. I'll listen to everything in a song mm. maybe 10 times before I even hear what somebody's saying. And if all that stuff feels good to me, then I'll start paying attention to what the lyrics are. So I think of songs in the reverse of most, uh, maybe songwriters, but maybe people in general, I don't know. But I think those things are important to me more than yeah. uh, lyrics are even. But I always liked that groove. And, and uh, me and Dan Wilson wrote that song and uh, yeah, I always just wanted it. We played it. We used to play it out live a long time ago, uh, pre, pre-Traveler, and it just kind of crept back up. I said, well, maybe we can try it again, and if we hook it, maybe you'll be okay with it. And, <laughs> and I, I think she, she liked it after we, we got it. I think what I'm hearing so far, Chris, is Morgan gets approval on these songs. Oh, of course. Yeah. Or at least discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'd be like, hey, just let me have this one thing, you know, like, but she's got good taste. Oh, yeah, great. So, and everything but men. That's what I like to say. <laughs> I don't know. I think she did all right. said Higher was uh, written in 2001 for, for a demo, and that's the title track on this album. Does that give you a moment of pause to look back at the last 22 years and to think, my gosh, I came to Nashville hoping some of this would maybe happen, and it's so far exceeded my dreams? Is it a marker for you? Certainly, there's always moments to reflect, and I've talked about, uh, I think, a lot of times in interviews, how songs, but gain meaning over time or the meanings change over time and so i don't know exactly how that's going to hit me when i hear it out in the world or see how people respond to it i think i'll have different feelings that's when the songs get meaning to me is when people assign the meaning to them you know i can think a song means one thing and i can write it and i can sing it and then it goes out into the world or you see people singing it back and you see that it means something to them that's probably not what you intended, mm. or maybe it's exactly what you intended, but it 
you see it in real time. It's got to be something when a stadium full of people sings any song that you sat in a room and wrote, and they love it so much and it means so much that they know all the words. It doesn't get old. It's, it's a really humbling and addictive experience, you know, at the same time. You know, you, when you hear that, it's a, it's a buzz, you know, to, to hear that. On a Nashville ride from struggling songwriter to music icon, Stapleton still prefers to let his songs be the stars. I don't do this for the fame part. It's that I was never, that's not a thing I like to chase. I'm in it for the music part mainly and the fun part, you know. And we're well beyond that, that you know, that's how I make a living. But um, that's, uh, yeah, that's what I'm in it for. Is there a different energy generally in New York? Always. Do you feel that? Yeah. Always. You know, when you come to New York, you can't have your B show. You gotta have your A show because last night they saw somebody that killed him. Right. After a few years out making music and touring with his buddies in Hootie and the Blowfish, Darius Rucker has returned to country. Turn on the good times, turn off the TV. Yeah, the only BS I need is beers and sunshine. What's the response been like to the, the new album? Oh, it's been great. I mean, we've been playing four, about four new songs off the record, and people are loving it. And I, I, as, a, as, as a musician, especially if somebody puts records out like I do, you just want that. You want, I want songs I can play live, songs that are going to resonate with people because the live shows are still why I do it. And it's been a minute since you've put out a solo album. What was it about this moment where you said, all right, I'm ready. It's time to say something again. It, it was time, you know, I just wanted to go play. I just wanted to go play country because I wasn't really thinking about making a record. And then finally, it was just like, man, I'm ready to, to write some songs. Those songs make up the new album, Carolyn's Boy, a tribute to Rucker's late mother, who died before her son's massive success. You soothe my soul like an old church hymn. Amen. Why did you dedicate this album to her? I mean, it was funny. I was uh, writing the song, and we, we started the recording, and I was having a bad day, you know, one of those bad mental health days. I just wasn't doing well. And I just remember sitting there and thinking, at the end of the day, I'm just my mom's boy. And right there, so I named the record Carolyn's Boy because really that's, in my heart, that's who I am. I'm just my mom's kid. And what does that mean to you, to be Carolyn's boy? She taught us to be nice. She taught us to care. She taught us to give back. She taught us to always be the best person you can be. And I, I really hope that, you know, she's looking down from heaven and I'm, I'm that man she wanted me to be. Born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina, Rucker is one of six children. Carolyn was a single mother who worked double shifts as a nurse to support the family. What was that household like? And now that you've grown up and you're a parent yourself, yeah. how much more respect even do you have for what your mom was able to do? Oh, absolutely. Being a parent, you really get it. You, you get it. And you know, for me, we, we were lucky. We had a village. My brothers and sisters were all still real close and everything. And my mom just taught us family. Family's everything. And, and that's something I took on to with my kids and, and you know with their lives and what influence did your mom have on the music i know you grew up in the church listening to music like so many good yeah. southern young boys and Absolutely. girls did that's where it starts and then you graduate to al green that's playing yeah. in the house was your mom a big part of your musical influence she was the biggest part she was a huge part because she always there was always music playing 
there was never music not played in the house, whether it was radio or records or whatever. And we had one of those big high fives, you know, yeah. that had all the records inside. And, and I would just listen to records. And she was great because she never let anybody tell me what I could listen to. Like my cousins would come over and I'd be listening to a rock and roll on the radio or something, or a country on the radio. And, and they'd come and ask me, you know, why you listen to that white boy music? And she would just lit into that. She would lit in, light into them and let them know you let him listen to what he wants to listen to. And, and it was great. She, I, I always say, I, I don't think I could have sang the songs I sang and made the music I made if my mom wasn't always a champion and protecting me from people telling me I could. But like, I always say she, she influenced all of the music. So she, I mean, she had good musical taste. Oh, yeah. I mean, really good musical taste. Oh, great musical taste. Because she was such a singer. She was a light years better than I am as a singer. And I would sit in the living room and sit, just listen to her singing because she was so amazing. Rucker stepped in front of the mic himself in 1986 when he and three friends at the University of South Carolina formed a band called Hootie and the Blowfish. Hootie became so popular on the Southern college circuit, the guys decided to make music a full-time job. I wanna love you the best that, the best that I can. Unfortunately, she didn't get to see you become the massive international star that you've become. But she saw you on your way. Oh, she yeah. saw you off to college, knew you were playing those kind of gigs. Yep. What kind of encouragement did she give you along the way? She never, when I told her it was a band and everything, she always encouraged me. I'll never forget the day after my junior year that I was going to tell her I was going to quit college. And I thought she was going to destroy me. I thought, you know, that was not going to be an option. And she looked at me and she said, if that's what you want to do, if this music thing is what you're going to do, do it. Wow. And that was a great day for me because I realized I had her behind me no matter what I had. You know, I didn't think I had a backup plan until I, she said that. And I was like, well, I guess she's my backup plan. For years, the band toured constantly, enjoying modest success until a 1994 appearance on David Letterman's show changed everything. Ladies and gentlemen, Hootie and the Blowfish. He heard us on Tuesday, had us on on Friday. And that that Friday morning, there was maybe five stations in the country playing it and all in the South, you know, Columbia yeah. and Charleston and Atlanta. And that Monday, we were the most added. And after that, it just went crazy. It changed our lives. Overnight. Overnight. The debut album, Cracked Rear View, went platinum 21 times over placing it among the best-selling albums in the history of music, earning the band two Grammy Awards, and making Hootie one of the biggest acts in the world. And just let her cry if the tears fall down like I was looking at the list of the best-selling albums of all time, and it's in the top 10. I mean, it's yeah. Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and all the Eagles and everything we Michael know. Jackson, Michael yeah. Jackson. Michael yeah. Jackson. Does that still blow your mind? Blows my mind. Yeah. Then we were like the eighth best selling record of all time. Yeah. And blows your mind. That that's like like wow. I mean, up there with all those people that we vitalize and think are great and all those records that we think are great. Do you remember a time you walked out on a stage and the crowd suddenly was big and the crowd suddenly was singing all the songs back to you yeah is that were there was there a moment or maybe a couple of moments like I that the, there was a moment there was a moment where uh we were playing this, this uh, uh we were playing a park in columbia a charity gig we were playing in 90 at, after that right after letterman and walking out and seeing you know 20 30 000 people and freak out and then two weeks later we play we play east, east lansing michigan I'll never forget this play, East Lansing, Michigan, and play in this big outdoor place that they can sell as many tickets as they want. And we get on stage and there's 77,000 people. Come on. So to what do you attribute 21 million albums? The songs are great, fun to sing along with. It's good music, we start there. But why did it become some other thing than just a successful album? I think, I, I think the only thing we can attribute it to is the songs and the production. I mean, the songs are great songs. Because it was one of those things where, you know, before streaming, we were at, you know, 15 or 16 or whatever. And, you, you know, you're in the top 15 selling records all of a sudden. That's great. But then streaming happens and it's a whole new thing. It's a whole new thing. And people still want the record. And, and it's just one of those things where for us, I, I like to think it's just the songs we wrote. We had Lighting in the Bottle. We wrote some great songs yeah. that people still resonate with. And that, that's what you want to do. How did you manage that part of the celebrity side of it? 
Which no one's ready for it to happen that no, quickly. No, gonna sell. We weren't ready for it, but the, we were lucky that we had each other. And we were always together. And and we never let each other get a big head or, let, or take it too serious. You know, it was always, anytime you try to do that, there was somebody, always somebody to cut you down. You know, we couldn't even wear black t-shirts back then without somebody letting you know, <laughs> what are you, a Bono? Or are you, who are you? You any better now? <laughs> so it was like, we had each other and that's how we dealt with it. Just staying insulated in our little group and realizing that the only thing we saw in this show was getting bigger. The show was getting bigger and somebody mechanized me in the airport. That, that's all we saw. It was still, we were still just the four of us. In 2008, Hootie took a break and Rucker went solo, turning to his southern musical roots. I got all I need, and it's all right by me. I always said, someday I want to make a country record. Someday I'm making a country record. Someday I'm making a country record. And that day finally came. Did you feel skepticism when you made that turn from radio stations, fans, everybody going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Understatement. What are we doing here? Understatement. I got lucky and got a record deal. And I, it's, it's so funny, the uh, the guy who gave me a record deal, Mike Dungan, said to my manager, Doc, he's like, you know, I never got that hootie thing, but I always thought that kid was a country singer. <laughs> and he gave, me a, he gave me a record deal, and I'm out visiting radio station stuff, and three radio station guys said this to me, to my face, I don't think my audience will ever accept a black country singer. Mm. And that was, I mean, the first time I heard it was shocking, because, you know, I knew they probably kind of felt that way, but you actually said it to me, you know? And, and that was more motivation for me. That was more, okay, how hard, how, what do you want me to do? How hard do I have to work? Tell me what I got to do to make this work. It worked right away. His first single raced to the top of the country charts, the first of his eight number one songs there. Among them, a 2013 rendition of Wagon Wheel which now is one of the best-selling country songs of all time. So ride me mama like a wagon wheel Ride me mama any way you feel Hey mama ride me It is even sitting here, it's shocking to hear that someone would say the things they said to your face sure. that a black artist can't make it in country music. Did you carry that with you when you went in? Did you feel any weight of like, I'm this breakthrough artist, I'm breaking barriers and all those things, or was it just like write the, good songs? The one thing I wanted to do was write good songs. I was like, let's make a great record, write good songs, all the other stuff comes with it. But once I made it, I wanted to see other people make it. I think everybody's looking for an African-American artist that's great, that I can get on the radio, that can be part of my stable, to be part of what we do at our label. And you know, I, I love being you know, one of the catalysts for that, that's pretty cool. We always think we're gonna hatred and all this stuff's gonna keep but when, and at the bottom line, people just want great music. Mm. That's all they want, is great music, a great song. I don't care what you look like or what you do. I want a great song, and you know, that's what we try to get. You keep giving it to them, yeah. Rucker is living a full circle moment, from listening to his mother sing in the family kitchen, to naming his latest hit album for the woman who planted the seeds of his life in music. Take me back to Carolina when the Lord says it's my time. Do you think about 
what she must be thinking somewhere? All the time. All the time. Uh, I, I think I think about two things. Which, uh, that I hope she's in heaven that looking down, being proud of me. And second of all, I always go, if she was alive, her house would be so much bigger than mine. <laughs> And she would have earned that, too. <laughs> earned that out. Her car would be nicer than mine. <laughs> It'd be awesome. Whatever you want, Mom. Hey, whatever you want, Mom. You could have it, for sure. It, I mean, to have listened to all that music with you, to have stilled it in you, and then to see what you've done with it, I just can't imagine what she's thinking somewhere. And that's really what it is. I mean, music was our life. She instilled all of that. My love for music came from her. And, and all I've wanted to do since I was four mm. was play music. And I'm 57 now. I've been doing it for 30 years on the big stage. It's just crazy. Crazy. I know she's proud of it. Uh, I like to think she is. I know you look, you're slinging it pretty well. Thank you. Yeah. I like a little bit of a kick, put some tahini on the rim. I know it's early, but whatever. Here you go, Willie. Aaron, thank you so much. I'm honored. Cheers. Cheers. A toast to the end of a tour where Marin Morris sold out venues across the country and mixed up her famous margaritas on the bus. Yeah, I'm just not ready for it to be over. I wish we had done more shows. <laughs> Maybe we can add a few at the end. Yeah, we'll just them here and now. For fun, I'll Tackle go. On. I'll go busk in the street. <laughs> yeah. I bet you would actually. You've, uh, done, yeah. you've done it before. I'll open the guitar case. The tour shares a name with her latest album called Humble Quest. What does Humble Quest mean to you? I think from 2020 on. Uh, to now, I've learned a lot about myself because my tour got canceled. I lost my producer, Busby, in late 2019. And so just everything was really humbling. I think just about being a human. It's like you are not in control. You never were. It was strange for all of us, but I have to imagine for someone who's been on the road for, what, 15 years or something like that, doing shows, grinding, hustling the whole time to just hit the brakes for two years, it was probably disorienting to you in some way. Your husband too, because he's a performer as well. I think the bottom fell out in many ways for me. And I've sort of learned through therapy that I have been doing this hustle since I was 10 or 11 years old. So I'm 32. I haven't stopped. It took the world coming to a halt for me to stop. Marin's son Hayes was born in March of 2020 in those first days of the pandemic. I think a lot of identity crises <laughs> happened there, not just like being a new parent and a new mother and dealing with, you know, postpartum depression for the first time and reeling from that and trying to like find the forest through the trees, but also just knowing my worth without someone clapping for me. I kind of felt like, this sounds so cheesy, but I, I felt like a woman, like the, the, the sort of form I was supposed to take a long time ago that I've been in arrested development over, it finally came because I had to stop doing this thing that always gave me this um, pride. So how did that manifest itself? What did it mean to you to become a woman, as you say? I think that I'm a child still in a lot of ways that I haven't properly matured uh, because I've always been able to throw it into 
music. But as far as relationships go, I think from a very early age, I've been taking care of myself and other people and just performing. And um, yeah, I think when you have your own kid and you, you kind of can't go to work, your purpose is very different. And so you kind of have to just like ch chisel it out of stone yourself. And I think I was probably supposed to do that a long time ago, but it just didn't happen until now. Don't know why, don't know why I let you, but I do. Cause I love chasing after you. She spent the time at home reflecting and writing songs with her husband, Ryan Hurd a fellow singer-songwriter. As far as being creative with him goes, it was like, can we just please write something light to pull me out of this like pandemic doldrum and I don't wanna you know, sit in the ashes very long here. So he kind of just helped me in song form and in just conversation form, figure out how to get to the, the light. I drove singles She began to find that light by reaching back to her early days in Nashville, long before she was a Grammy-winning chart-topping star. Circles Around This Town stands out among other great songs. What is the message of that song? What are you saying? Well, the, the line that I love is, I thought when I had hit it, it all looked different, but I've still got the pedal down, driving circles around this town. And that to me was like, I moved to Nashville 10 years ago with nothing. And I really had to build myself up and build my song repertoire just from scratch. And I think I still have that grind in me that is like, your best song is the last one you wrote. So you always are trying to one up yourself. And that's the beautiful competition art form that is Nashville songwriting is like, all your friends are better than you. Mm. And it just, it doesn't make you downtrodden, it makes you excited to show them the last thing you wrote. So that community there is really special to me because I feel like they hold me accountable, they also make me a better writer every single time I go back into the room. Yeah, isn't it interesting, I've found this too, where you think in the course of your career there's gonna be some moment where you go, I did it, and you put your feet up, but if you have the motor that people like you and I probably both have, you never put your feet up, right? Yeah, I mean, Ryan, my husband jokes that uh, he'll be wheeling me off the casino <laughs> stage <laughs> when we're like, I'm 90 or something. That's gonna be my fate. It's like, I'll probably just die on stage <laughs> um, because I love it so much. I don't wanna take time off. I don't like the idea of saving up a bunch and retiring because it's not a job to me. It's, it's like my passion. Coming up on the honky-tonk circuit in her home state of Texas, Morris spent her early years in Nashville writing songs for other people. But it was the one she kept for herself, 
that changed her life. My Church was a coming out party for Morris, and the hits have been coming ever since. I'm a 90s baby in my 80s Mercedes. Including two number one singles. When the bones are good, the rest don't care. Off of her second album, Girl. Don't you hang your head low. And of course, the relentlessly popular song, The Middle, where she sang lead vocals with Gray and Zed. Did you have any sense when you put that song out that it was going to become this massive hit, number one, and change your life in the way that it did? I think it just opened up a huge world audience to my voice. And so if anyone ever heard that, like, baby, they'd be like, who is this? Oh, Maren Morris, who's that? And then, you know, they would go to my previous work. So why don't you just meet me? When you sit down to write any new album now, do you think about hits at this point? Or are you just trying to write great songs? I think a hit for me at this point is just a byproduct of hopefully a great song. I can't go in and create with that formula in my head of what I think a hit will be because then you end up following a trend that someone has already set. Um, and I think that you want it to be the opposite of that. You want to set it and create something that's new. Or if it is reminiscent or nostalgic of something else, it's done in a way that's really fresh. And um, so, yeah, it's at this point, I, I've had crossover success. I've had songs on pop radio, on hot AC, on country. I'll always take it when it comes, but I don't go in and set out to be the hit maker. I just want to write a great song, and I want to connect with my friends that I'm writing it with and connect to a higher self or God or whatever it is in that room, that's what I'm there to do. I hesitated to use the term crossover, but since you used it, yeah. what does that mean to you exactly? Because it seems to me that genre doesn't really matter as much anymore. Yeah. If you're good, you're good and people find it wherever it is. Everything has gone over to streaming and um, people are just pulling up playlists based on mood. Yeah. Uh, which I love. That's kind of how I search for things. But respecting and staying true to a root of what made you fall in love with a genre in the first place is important. But um, I, it's not my Bible. Uh, I think that I am so influenced by so many genres, and I've never said otherwise. Like, from my church on, it's always been the kitchen sink. Success in music has given Morris a voice outside of it, too. She has been outspoken on social issues from abortion rights and gun control to the need for diversity in country music and defending trans youth. You use your voice and your platform to speak out on issues. When you started to do that, was there any trepidation of, I'm about to step in it, and now I'm going to be in the middle of it? Yeah, I think it's gotten more galvanized since I've had my son that I am really trying to make something beyond music. And I want people to look around at my shows and realize, okay, this is really loving and safe and comfortable. Like no matter what walk of life or where you come from, I want you to be able to be safe at my show. And I'm willing to be uncomfortable to do that. Is there a risk to it? Because I would say I'm a fan of country music. Most artists aren't going to sit down in an interview and talk about the things you talk about or to even go on social media and take on those issues because they say, maybe I believe that, maybe I do feel that way. It's just not worth the fight. It's not worth losing fans. Do you feel any hit from doing that? I mean, Honestly, like when I put my church out, I, I kind of got my first dose of criticism of people saying the song is like blasphemous at my church. And I remember, you know, oh, wow, I'm really going to have to have some thick skin to get through this if this is like the song that's already pissing people off in a very weird way. So I think from the get go, I've gone through the chapters of um, feeling just the, the criticism and knowing that, you know what, 
you're going to piss people off either way, so you better let them know where you stand. And I think that, yeah, I've probably lost listeners along the way, um, but I think the ones I've gained and the ones I've retained, they know exactly who I am and what they're getting, and I see the residual effect of it now that time has passed of the positivity that it's ingrained into the, the fan base. Um, so even if you take a hit here and then, you know, here and there, it's, it's, uh, it's worth it. With the Humble Quest tour now wrapped, it seems Morris has a new itch. I want to do Broadway. You do? Yeah. I've really tried to just scare myself the last few years. I like hosted a late night show, had never done that. Yeah. I flew with the Air Force Thunderbirds in like a fighter jet. <laughs> I'm talking to you. I'm just kidding. Um, That's an adventure. Yeah. Living her life with some spice and a kick. That is delicious, truly. Not just because you made it. Thank you for giving Cheers. me a bar to do it in. <laughs> Cheers again. Cheers. Thank you. The story of Niall Horan's life is one of an Irish teenager thrust to worldwide fame as a member of the biggest group on the planet. Let's go crazy, crazy, crazy till we see the sun. Horan and his bandmates in One Direction flew to the top of the charts, filling stadiums around the world and selling more than 70 million albums. I remember thinking, right, I've just been through the craziest thing that could possibly happen to someone. And he was not certain about what was waiting on the other side of that dizzying phenomenon. Scary prospect, obviously, coming off the back of the band. But I just had to keep it going. I wanted to make music and just had to trust it. That trust has paid off in a successful solo career. Horan's latest album is called The Show a record created when he finally was forced to slow down. So it's the summer of 2020. Take me back to that time for you. Mm. And you're trying to put out new music. You've just had your second album come out in March of that year. Sure, yeah. And you're getting ready to go on a tour. Of mm. course, everything is canceled, <laughs> except you don't have your instruments. All my gear was locked away. We were just about to go on tour in that, that April. All my guitars had left my house. They were all boxed up in a lockup somewhere, ready to go to the first show. And it was just me and the, the piano and in the house. So when you sat down at that piano, were you doing that to start to write a new album? Or was that just something to sort of pass the time and get through this bizarre moment? And I'm always kind of just like noodling anyway. You know, you just kind of sit down there and play around, sing some melodies, play some chords and hope for the best. And then if it doesn't come, it doesn't come. That's when, when I wrote that and sung the first couple of lines and the lyrics came out. I was like, oh, maybe this is the time now. And this is, maybe this is the start of a record. If everything was easy, nothing ever broke. If everything was simple, how would we know? The show is the title. Let's start there. What does that mean? What is the show? Well, it didn't mean anything until I wrote the song, the show. The lyric in the, in the song, the show, is basically me saying how grateful I should feel for everything. Because during the pandemic, we kind of lost all of that control that we like, like to have as humans. The show then became a metaphor for, for life 
in my head, like, you know, the different acts mm -hmm. throughout. And then straight away, once I'd written that song, I realized, all right, well, there's a title for a record. And now that title provokes thoughts, you know, that make up the different spokes of the wheel of life. Mm. And, and that's kind of where it started from. There's a, at a weightiness or in mm. some of the subject matter is heavy, despite the sort of some of pop sound to some of it anyway. Is that fair to say? Yeah, I think it's very fair. Um, there's, there's a weightiness to it um, in a different way than my previous stuff. Like I tend to be the guy that writes the, that, the breakup songs and the, I literally, my last album was called Heartbreak Weather. Yep. Um, <laughs> and I've tend to been that guy, but when there's no heartbreak, the, the subject matter changes and what was going on in the world. I just gotten into a new relationship, so that was good. But then there was the other side of things where the weight of the world that was 2020 and the time I was writing down notes, you know, that's what was going on on the planet. Um, I tend to try and write with a bit of weight, but my songs always seem to have some sort of like a silver lining to them. Mm -hmm. I tend to try and have like, as dark as they sound, I try and make them have a bit of uplift and a bit of, a bit of hope somewhere along the line. You're a big vinyl guy? Yeah. yeah. I think it's because of all I grew up on. The 29-year-old Horan grew up in Mullingar, Ireland, about an hour outside of Dublin. He was raised on bands like the Eagles and Fleetwood Mac and taught himself to play the guitar. I probably didn't properly start playing until I was probably 10, 11 maybe. There was a guitar in the house that I was given to a, as a gift to someone and they never played it. So it was like this little nylon stringed yeah. kind of Spanishy type guitar and it was just sitting around and I would like it was at the start of like the broadband dial-up connection <laughs> so when everyone was not using the landline <laughs> I was like sitting on YouTube and I never I was still to this day I never had a guitar lesson or anything like this but I, would, right? like, I would sit on YouTube watch songs that I liked like guys playing covers on them on YouTube and like pause when they'd like set their fingers really on the frets Wow. And just like see where their fingers were. So to this day, I couldn't tell you more than about six chords. <laughs> At 16 and with no formal training, Horan was convinced by his high school French teacher to audition for the British singing competition, The X Factor. I think you're unprepared. I think you came with the wrong song. You're not as good as you thought you were. Despite a rocky start, the judges put Horan through later teaming him up with Louis Tomlinson, Zayn Malik, Liam Payne, and Harry Styles to form One Direction. They finished in third place, but that was just the beginning. What Makes You Beautiful went number one first week, and then there was a bit of noise around Europe, and we went over to Europe, and it was like thousands of screaming girls in the streets of Amsterdam and Milan and, you know, Berlin and places like this. And it was like, what's going on? We were just on a, a network TV show a couple of weeks ago. And then, uh, then it started, a bit of noise started coming from over here. And then it just snowballed and it, but it snowballed very fast. And um, the rest is history, I suppose. Yeah. <laughs> So how does a teenage boy, and you were boys, how do you begin to wrap your head around what's happening? You come from a humble place, you've got your family and friends who mean so much to you, and all of a sudden the streets are filled with people screaming your name. How do you begin to cope with that? Everyone was just in a state of shock the whole time. Like, looking at the first billboard in Times Square, you're like, Times Square? I've seen that in the movies, you know? There was always a bit of like, where are we? How, how do we do this? I think that was what was attracted a lot of people to the band. I think it was very clear that it was five working class blue collar kids who were just the deer in the headlights and are now like these worldwide known people. We have to remember, we, it was us, our team, our bubble around us, and we just kind of went from place to place worldwide and just kind of went along with it. If you're looking in, it must have looked crazy, you know, and everyone's going, you're the biggest band. And we were just kind of still having a great time. And just, yeah. we always used to say like, normal people doing an abnormal job. Um, 
which is a, a good outlook to have. Um, remember one, one of the stadium tours was called Where We Are Tour, because we always used to be like, look where we are. <laughs> <laughs> it was literally named, because we were just always like, oh, that's hell's going on. on. Um, <laughs> And every time, every now and then, you catch yourself just like looking at each other, just going, "This is nuts!" Like on stage at like the Met Life or the Garden, or you know, you'd have a moment every now and then. It's just like, "This is nuts." Thankfully, that's never gotten old. I love it. You keep that wonder about you. Yeah. Anybody who knows you says you're obviously an extraordinary artist, but you you've kept your you're a normal guy. You know, you can sit and have a pint and jump in there and sing karaoke. <laughs> is that just the, your foundation, your family, your friends, just keeping grounded in all of that. You just have to have the right people around you and keep friends and family close and and don't let any infiltrations or anything like that happen. And then just yeah, just be yourself. Um, I think people can people can see through the, the mm -hmm. BS sometimes. As you look back on it now, these years later, does it feel like a dream or something? Or how do you look at it now as a I think I've been able man? to I think I think that was what was important about the pandemic for me too. It was, as I said, it was the first time I'd sat still. With that comes reflection and like just actually sitting, think, sitting and just going like, what's just happened for the last 10 years? This is the first time I've actually had to like think about the achievements and the tours and the, the fact that I can say that we played like two years of stadiums is <laughs> just nuts. Not many people can say that at all. In the, most, in the most humble way, I say that. So having that period to just like sit back and be like, oh my God. It does, it nearly feels like it's a, like a separate life now that I'm like a bit older and a bit, you know, I've solved the world now. <laughs> like, I've, um, I'm so mature now. You're but a wise is, man. Yeah. Yes. But I definitely have a wiser, like in a, a good outlook on things looking back. I didn't lose the plot along the way. <laughs> I'm not a Hollywood horror story. Right, right. <laughs> Oren has imparted some of that wisdom during his first season as a coach on The Voice, where he won the competition with singer Gina Miles. You are unbelievable. How much fun has that been for you? Oh, it's been great. Like, I was nervous going into it, you know, having come from a show like that. Right. I was like, do I want to go back into something like that? I've never mentored anyone before, but it's, it was the best decision I made. It's so much fun. I bet you have incredible empathy for the people on that oh, side yeah. of it, having been there before. For sure, yeah. I know exactly what it's like to stand there and like have your future in some famous bloke's hand, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I'm the, I'm the famous dude with, my, with the future in the hand. <laughs> With three albums under his belt, Horan has shown he can stand alone, away from the boys in the band. Went back to London and I just, I just had to trust that, I guess the biggest thing for me was, I knew I could write a song, how good was the next question. I had a, a fan base that if I was to release something, there was a, a fan base there to receive in some shape or form. 
you know, some people would hang on to it and some people wouldn't, whatever it may be. I just had to kind of trust that I could write a song and that if I was to release something, some people would be there to take it on. How long it was going to last, again, we don't, we never know. You had the advantage of a built-in fan base, as you said, but also it seems to me the challenge of some people wanting to just put you in that box and mm. say, they're boy banders, that mm. was a moment in time. Mm. You had to prove yourself. Yeah, for sure, yeah. I think there's, there's always a level of trying to prove yourself. Like, it's so competitive out there. It's not easy to just go and like write a song, release it, and just be convinced that it's just going to do well. Like that's never a guarantee ever. It's still not. Um, but you, there's definitely a, an element of right. I'm going to put my best foot forward here, try and give everything I can in performances, be myself in interviews, and then the rest is just like up to the people. Mm -hmm. It's the great thing about music these days is that power is in the people's hands. They'll make the decisions on whether you stick around or not. And then hopefully you write a good song here and there. <laughs> and there's a bit of longevity to it. Um, I've been doing it for, what is it, 14 years now. I really hope it doesn't stop anytime soon. Okay. No, I think you're in good shape, my friend. I think it's good. Yeah. <laughs>is just getting started for Olivia Rodrigo as she celebrates the release of her sophomore album. Congratulations on release day. Thank you so much. Yeah, it's been a very exciting few hours. You draw quite a crowd, my friend. She's calling it guts. These are my, my guts rings. And the critics are calling Rodrigo a rock star. And guts means what to you in the context of this album? It means a few things. It means courage. It means trusting your gut. It means having, you know, following your intuition. I like spilling your guts too. I feel like there's some of that on this yeah, album. Yeah, I feel like every song I've ever written is sort of just me spilling my guts a little bit. Just 20 years old, the singing songwriting phenom has a talent for turning angst and heartbreak into hits. Do you ever, when you're sitting down spilling your guts in front of a piano, do you ever have any hesitation of like, ooh, maybe I shouldn't go this far, maybe I shouldn't tell this one? It doesn't feel like it. Yeah. I mean, <laughs> uh, in the moment when I'm writing a song, I try not to censor myself too much or think about, you know, what people on the internet are gonna say about it, um, just because I think that it's kind of the antithesis of creativity, but yeah. um, it's, you know, it, after, after the fact, then it's kind of when you have to be like strategic, I suppose, I don't know. <laughs> but it's out there now, so. It's out there. Let it ride. People have had a lot to say about Rodrigo's music ever since she exploded onto the scene with her Grammy-winning debut album, Sour. Brutal out of here. Rolling Stone called Sour Rodrigo's greatest hits album on her first try. Highlighted by the five times platinum driver's license. I got my driver's license last week, just like we always talked about. A poignant power ballad about marking a teenage milestone amid heartache. You said forever. With a bridge embraced by TikTok. Saturday Night Live.
I was thinking back to January of 2021 when driver's license came out. You're still a <laughs> senior in high school. Mm -hmm. And then you wake up one morning and everybody knows your name and everyone's singing that song. Mm -hmm. With two and a half years of perspective on that now, how do you describe what that was like? It's really interesting. I feel like at the time, I didn't quite realize how much it would change my life. In the moment, I was just so full of adrenaline. I'm like, hey, let's get the next song out. Let's do the album. And it wasn't until recently where I really had the space and time to take a step back and be like, whoa, that was insane. That was, you know, such a huge moment for me, something that I'll remember when I'm 85. And I love that song so much just for me. I wrote that song and, and, and loved it because it just so acutely expressed what I was going through at the time. And the fact that it resonated in the way that it did is just so meaningful. I, I owe so much to that song and it opened so many doors for me. So I'm um, just full of so much gratitude for and it. As it's setting streaming records and going to number one and SNL is doing an entire <laughs> sketch on it yeah. and you're watching this happen to your song and to your life. What What's going through your mind? What are you thinking? How are you handling that? Honestly, a healthy level of dissociation goes a long way. Yes. I think yeah. uh, when I was 17 or 18, you know, you just can't really read into all of that too much. You kind of just have to put your horse blinders on and focus on what you can control because so much of it is just beyond anything you could really fathom or, or control, you know? And then you proved that it wasn't just about that song. I mean, <laughs> you put out another one, a hit, another one, a hit, and it became the biggest album of the year. Again, Rolling Stone called it the best album of the year. So as you were sitting down now to write Guts, did you feel like, Okay, this better be good. Did you feel all that when you were putting this album together? So much pressure. You know, everyone always says, like, your only competition is yourself. And I was like, oh, God, if my only competition is myself, I don't know how I'm going to beat this. Like, that was just such crazy success that I could have never expected or prepared myself for. And so I, I definitely, I mean, I won't lie, I had a really tricky time setting out to make Guts. But I think kind of halfway through the writing process, I sort of shifted my mindset into not trying to beat something or, or, or make a song that would go number one. And I just tried to make songs that I would like to hear on the radio. And that's when kind of the real good stuff started happening. I had a lot more fun and the songs really improved. Um, so yeah, I, I think at the end of the day, you just have to focus on doing what you love and making songs that you enjoy. That's all you can do. You have such a maturity in your songs about things like heartbreak and relationships, even on Sour. And as you say, you were 16, 17 years old writing these sort of sophisticated songs that I'm not sure most teenagers <laughs> have thought through in that way or can articulate in the way that you have. Where does that, I guess, emotional maturity come from? How do you think so deeply and express it so well at your age? Thanks. I mean, I've been writing songs since I could talk. I've always <laughs> been doing it. So I've written so many songs in my life, written so many bad songs, got a lot of practice. But I, I, I really believe that really good songs kind of don't come from you, they kind of come through you, you know? It's, it's, it's kind of like something else. It's like a, a magical thing. And sometimes you write a song and you're like, wow, I don't even know how that came to be. It's just, um, it's just kind of this beautiful flow. So I, I credit a lot, of, a lot of my songs to that sort of magic. The magic began in Southern California, where Rodrigo grew up with parents who played Alanis Morissette, Gwen Stefani, and the White Stripes in the house. Do you get deja vu? <laughs> Rodrigo first sat down at the piano at seven. By 12, she was writing songs. She did some acting too, but music Just a city boy. was her first love. Do you remember those first songs when you were 12? Yeah, it's so funny. I listen back to that. I still have them on my phone, and I'm like, gosh, I was so angsty. I had such a perspective. I'd write all these, like, feminist songs about, like, all these, like, people that wronged me or, like, all these issues that I had, and I'm like, you're in sixth grade. Like, what? what's going on? Rodrigo since has sharpened the songwriting around that angst and proven herself a sharp businesswoman as well. When she signed her first record deal at just 17, she negotiated for ownership of the master recordings of her music. The label agreed, perhaps underestimating her potential. How did you have the instinct to do that 
how did you negotiate that? Because it has paid off in a way that other artists have, have struggled with. I think that I've been really lucky to be surrounded by people who really look after me and take care of me in a very real, genuine way. That's something that I, I really have never taken for granted. I, it's, it's super instrumental, I feel like, in my career. And uh, I don't know, I, I, I've just really always wanted to have total creative control over everything that I do. Like the money part and all of that is great and fun, but um, it's just so freeing to be able to say whatever you want, express how you feel however you want, and you know, be in control of, of your life and career. That's something that's just so meaningful to me, and I, I feel really happy that I'm in a position where I can have that. I hate to give the satisfaction asking how you're doing now. On Guts, Rodrigo goes full pop punk. Well, just so you know, most mortals don't have number one hits oh. flowing through their bodies <laughs> when they sit down at a piano. But I think Maybe. Vampire was that way a little bit too, wasn't it? Where you sat down at a piano and it just sort of yeah. happened? Yeah, I was getting ice cream with my friends and I was really upset about this thing that I wrote Vampire about. And I just had this burning desire to sit down at the piano and I'm sitting down at the piano and the chords just came and I was like, oh, Vampire, I don't know, it just popped into my head. I, I you know, hadn't really ever thought about writing a song like that. and. Uh, yeah, it just kind of came really naturally. So why is it so important to you, because this is true of all your songs, to not talk publicly about who or what exactly it's about? I think explanation is never good for <laughs> art. Why would I like pigeonhole a song into being about this one thing in my life when everyone has their own interpretation? It's the beauty of music. It just makes me feel less alone in my feelings. You know, when I write the song about some specific instance that where I felt this really strong way and then I look out into the crowd and I see some girl who felt the exact same way, it just makes me realize that, you know, we're all so much more alike than we are different and no one's ever really alone in their feelings. Is it still a trip to you to have that feeling, which is to say, to go out into a stage, a song you wrote maybe with one other person in the <laughs> privacy of a little room mm -hmm. and you feel like I, maybe someone will connect with this, to hear an entire arena or an entire stadium singing those words back to you? Yeah, I think it's a feeling that you never really get used to. I think songs are, are one of the most powerful mediums there are. You know, uh, you can write a song in 20 minutes and, you know, a, a huge crowd of 5,000 people could sing every word, you know? Uh, it's just, it's really powerful. There's a, there's a lot of responsibility in that, I think. She has grown up during this whirlwind couple of years, but she's still having fun. The first album was very much about heartbreak, and I love that. That's what I needed to say at the time. I was very heartbroken. And I think this time around, I was just more thinking about the pressures of young adulthood and, you know, sort of the growing pains that um, come along with just turning 20. I, I wrote the album when I was. 19 and 20 and uh, I think it also just takes itself a lot 
uh, less seriously, which I, I really enjoy. It's very playful and fun, and I just wanted to make songs would be really cool to sing at a concert and jump around to. So I feel like that's what we tried to do. So you've said that the last couple of years you've grown up by a decade, much more <laughs> than the two years or so. Yeah. How much are you different today than you were when you were writing those songs for Sour? Oh my gosh, I'm a completely different person. I mean, I wrote all those songs for Sour when I was 17 and I'm 20 now. And obviously my life has changed drastically, you know, my career and my environment, everything's so different. Um, but I just think all of that pales in comparison to how much you change as an individual from the ages of 17 to 20. Yeah. I feel like I learned so much about myself and who I wanted to be and the people that I wanted to surround myself with. And um, you sort of just, yeah, I have sort of this new confidence that I didn't have before. People have called you the voice of your generation. <laughs> They've said that you've sort of captured what it means to be your age or close to your age in this moment in time. Do you have any sense for what that means exactly? <laughs> no, oh my gosh, it's so, so crazy. It's such a, wow, that's a, that's a really big title. Because you're just telling your own story, yeah. but it just so happens to reflect what a lot of people are going through. All I can do is be myself, I think, and write songs that I like. And um, I think the fact that people gravitate towards them is amazing. Road to Country Stardom began in an unlikely place. I started in a bathroom, as weird as that sounds, just doing songs and covers in a bathroom. From the bathroom to the biggest stages in music, Brown recently finished his sold out Drunk or Dreaming international tour. It's gotta feel good as an artist to be yeah. able to travel the world and fill up those arenas. You're not, we're not just talking about, you know, Atlanta and Chattanooga yeah. anymore. Like, you're a global star. What does that feel like? I mean, dude, it feels amazing, um, especially like coming from where I came from, my background, getting to go to, you know, Australia. I never really left Georgia, so now I'm getting to travel the world to do music, and it makes absolutely no sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> All I'm thinking about is how I'm homesick. The son of a white mother and a black and Native American father, Brown was raised in northwest Georgia and southeastern Tennessee. His childhood was marked by periods of homelessness, abuse at the hands of a stepfather, and racism. Brown found stability with his grandmother and solace in music. Poverty, abuse, racism, all the things you encountered as a young man, how much does that childhood, which was difficult by your own admission, how does that inform your music? Do you still feel it when you're sitting to write a song? Um, not as much as I did when I first came in. And I still, I wanna go back to that. But I feel like I've told a lot of my story. And, and I have noticed like as I keep going and more of my story opens up, especially on stage, like I, now it's, it's, it's went even further and, and I feel like that's going to happen. It's going to lead to something else and, and maybe a documentary or a movie or something, which I think would be really cool. Where did it start for you? Where did you get that bug for? Not, not necessarily I'm going to grow up and be a, a, a star, but like I just like singing. I like playing. I like listening to music. How did that start for you? Uh, well, music was always my life. That was kind of my escape, even though I didn't realize it. 
coming up through my childhood. It started coming out more when I started working at Lowe's. And in the meantime, like while I was mixing paint, I was singing. My buddy ended up hearing me and told me to try out for the talent show. So then when I try out for the talent show, um, I got like an encore. And so then that was like kind of what sparked me wanting to sing. And then I just started posting it to Facebook. Did your uh, coworkers like that you were singing on the job? Yeah, yeah. He was like, man, you gave me cold chills. And I didn't know what to think about it. I was like, really? And uh, that's, you know, that's what sparked everything. And I'm very competitive. So then once you know, people told me that they liked it, then I was like, I wonder how many other people I can get to like it. And it started way back in third grade. In between shifts at Lowe's and later FedEx, Brown posted covers of country hits to Facebook. His rendition of Lee Bryce's I Don't Dance, recorded in the bathroom, exploded while he slept. Yeah, I was that kind of man. I remember waking up and my phone was completely black and put it on the charger. And immediately, once it turned on, I just got notifications for hours. I couldn't unlock my phone. I couldn't do anything. It just kept popping up. I remember it being 60,000 followers overnight. Wow. And I thought that was big. And then fast forward, and then I, I did a George Strait check, yes or no, and 60,000 turned into millions. And then that's when I started just writing my own music. <laughs> so what was it like the next day at work? Uh, well, this time, now I'm at FedEx. Okay, <laughs> so, okay, you moved on. And so I was uh, coming in late to work, you know. I, I was taking multiple lunch breaks, going, <laughs> doing covers in my car. And my boss was cool with it, because uh, he liked to watch the numbers go up with me. We'd post it, and I'd be like, it would just immediately just flood my inbox. And so he would just sit there and watch it with me, thought it was the coolest thing. And uh, he wanted to see how far I could go. And I get a, a call saying that we need you to move to Nashville. He just told me, he's like, yeah, man, go. And then you can come back if you need to. So it was a, a assurance thing for me. Brown moved to Music City to chase the dream. What were some of the reactions you heard from people in Nashville? No, I wouldn't say it was just Nashville. I'd say it was everywhere. I mean, was especially the internet. They'd be like, just look at him. He's not country. That's not what country looks like, yada, yada, yada. But I feel like it's also what made me blow up on Facebook because, I mean, I had a lot of people that they clicked my video and they're like, I thought you were going to rap. <laughs> and then I started singing, so it kind of it shocked them and then they wanted to share it. You say what if I heard you? Brown proved his doubters wrong, releasing a self-titled debut album in 2016 featuring his first number one song, What Ifs. What if I was made for you and you were made for me? What if this is it? And the nine times platinum smash, Heaven. I don't know how, I don't know how heaven, heaven could be better than me. Brown continues to defy country conventions. He has crossed over to the pop charts with hits like One Thing Right, a collaboration with DJ Marshmallow. I've been wrong about a million times, but I got one thing right. You. How do you describe your sound? I think it kind of just evolves over time. When I first got into music, I was really scared of everything. I was like, well, if I do this wrong, if I do this wrong. And now it's just I get to be myself. And I wish I would have got to do that from the beginning. But it's hard, man. You, know, you, you, you want to be successful and you feel like you got to play the, by the book and all this stuff. Um, but it, you know, I did. And it helped me get here. And now it helps me get to open up. Now, the other rumor about you is you're a good basketball player. I'm True. okay. What's your game like? I got to scout you real quick. Uh, well, it's getting, I'm getting older, so it's getting a little slow. <laughs> Dude, if you're old, where do you see me out there? Hey, I don't know what it is. The other day, I, I played at my house, and it's been a couple months, and uh, my lower back was hurting me for like four days. Mm -hmm. My shins hurt for like nine days. <laughs> I was popping Advil. I, I, mean, I take Advil before I play now. So that's just telling you. <laughs> the preemptive Advil yeah. is the first step toward middle age yeah. basketball guy. What position did you play in high school? I played small forward, shot a lot of threes. I had to get in there and get some rebounds too. How about you? Uh, I was all over the place, yeah. Not nice center. So are you, is it true that you 
are the only artists ever to play every NBA arena on a tour. We were eating at lunch one day and they were like, would you want to play every NBA arena? I said, of course. Yeah. And you can make it happen. So yeah. my team made it happen. There hey, it is. I made there it. it is. I played sports my whole life, so when I get to do these things, it's just so memorable because I'll never play in the NBA. <laughs> but, you know, I got to play inside of the NBA arena. So. We've both come to terms with the fact we're not going to play in the NBA. No. Despite what you're seeing here today. If somebody wants to give us a look, you know? See what I mean? I just spot up shoot now. That's it. I, hey, I see it. Oh. <laughs> Got to leave on a made one. There he is. There we go. That's it. 100%. Still hasn't missed. Doing it his way, Brown is filling stadiums and making history. This summer, he became the first black artist ever to headline a concert at Boston's famed Fenway Park. When I started playing bigger places, I got like imposter syndrome. It moved too fast. I wasn't the greatest on stage. I wondered what everybody thought about me. I was so nervous to be on stage because I'm a very shy guy. Uh, but whenever I'm on stage, I'm the guy that I wish I was all the time. You're gonna be on a lot of stages singing it coming up on this new tour. I don't know how much you can say yet, but we're talking big venues yep. starting next year. We're doing six stadiums, uh, which I'm really excited about. When we did Fenway, I knew that I was supposed to be there. Mm. Fenway was very iconic to me. And when I got out there, you know, there was no nerves. There was no Oh my God, it was like, it's showtime and I'm gonna, you know, put on a show and let these people know that I'm so glad they're here. Brown shared the stage that night with his wife, Caitlin, a singer herself. The couple has two young daughters and a number one hit. Thank God your hand fits perfectly in mine. Another cool element about your performance is performing with your wife, right? Yeah. Singing Thank God with your two beautiful little girls, maybe somewhere in the stadium. Yeah, they're it, asleep. <laughs> they're out. By the time you come on, they're done. Yeah. Uh, how cool is that, not only to perform with Caitlin, but also to have it become such a hit? Thank God. It was awesome. I knew it was going to be a hit from the start, you know? Uh, we, we met through music, and once we found this song, we used to do covers and stuff and put it on YouTube, and so my fans knew that she sung, uh, but not the whole, you know, place, country world, whatever. And we found this song when we put it out. She was nervous. And I was like, babe, this song's gonna be a smash. It don't even have to go to radio. Like, it's gonna be a smash because my fans have been waiting on it and you're amazing. But I remember when, before we went out on stage at Fenway, she was like, I'm gonna throw up. <laughs> <laughs> she was like, I'm gonna throw up. I was like, just look at me. I'm right here. Everything's gonna be okay. And then she came out, she killed it. And then everybody lit their phones up and sang it back uh -huh. to us. It's her first number one. And it was just amazing for her. And I was glad that I got to be a part of it. You don't know what the response always is gonna be. And mm -hmm. then to walk out at Fenway Park with your wife and have 35, 40,000 people singing every word back to you. What is that feeling like? Uh, I mean, it's the best feeling in the world, man. 
So that raises the question, will you and your wife now, because that was such a hit, is there gonna be more music from oh, the, the two of you, yeah? Of course, yeah, yeah. We're actually working on it right now. Um, just finished my studio, so hopefully we get a lot more. Maybe she'll jump on a ride too. She <laughs> says she's a little rusty, but I, <laughs> I bet she's all right. It's amazing to look at the charts, particularly this summer, but in general, and you've been right up at the top of them, how country has gone so mainstream and to see the top three or four songs, not just in country, but in all music be country. It feels like you were part of a wave of a new generation of people who are taking country to a different place. Does it feel that way to you at all? I just do my own thing, man. <laughs> I don't even you know, look at that type of stuff. Um, I just do my, my music. I just love that I can be all over the place and be myself. And, and not be worried about it, and then people can come to my shows and still have fun. Only ones I keep around me is my fam. No coincidence, it's always been the plan. Do you stop and have moments, and you go, man, it's a long way from here back to the Facebook videos and the, the childhood I had. I just don't think about it, because I feel like, you know, everything that I went through was a part of my life that got me here. And I'm actually proud of it, even though a lot of it was tough and hard, and you didn't know what was going to come out of it. but. I feel like that's who made me who I am today, made me strong, made me want to give back to people, made me humble, and just made me proud of who I am and where I came from. Oh my God, thanks for having to me. See, when you walk into a studio like this, mm -hmm. is it hard for you like not to sit at the piano or not to pick up the guitar? <laughs> yeah, my eyes are just darting around <laughs> at figured. all the possibilities. <laughs> when did music come into your life? I guess, how did music come into your life? Well, you know, my family always did music and my uh, grandfather, Grandpa Vernon, he was like a country yodeler. And um, we all loved him so much and he got ALS mm. and he died really young at 50. Mm. And my parents were young parents, and so I just, with all of that was really um, vivid in the loss of his voice. I remember being a paramount turning point for my mother, who was also a country singer. I feel the way she coped with her grief was to dive into singing. He always wanted her to do it, and she's painfully shy about it. And so she, you know, took a little bit of the money that he left and bought a PA system and started like a bar band and auditioned out at a community theater and involved me because I was so interested and I was only eight maybe at the time. So I got up on stage for the first time in a community theater called the Northwest Grand Old Opry at about eight and started singing and that became what the Carlisles did. And so it had a weight to it. It was really sacred to our family and I still love country music to this day, classic country music, because I feel like it, you know, it raised us and got us through such a traumatic time for mm. our mom. And um, all I could think about was being famous, getting on stage, Is that right? hearing applause. Oh, yeah. yeah. From eight years old, basically. Yeah. This is what I'm going to do. Oh, yeah. yeah. And it was never just music for the love of music. It was music for the love of people. At what point did someone in your life say, hmm, her voice is special? <laughs> There's something extraordinary about what's coming out of her mouth. Someone say that to you at any point? Or did you realize that I can really belt it? I think I thought I was special long before I was special. <laughs> <laughs> okay. 
<laughs> you had that swagger. I remember oh, singing in the dentist's office, singing on the bus, singing, just singing for anybody that would listen and feeling really special and not being, you know. Um, but what, what, just wanting to be, really, really wanting to be. And um, just eventually started to like study it mm. and take it really, really seriously so that I could get to where I wanted to get to. And I see it, I see it in other young people too, the audacity, mm. the American exceptionalism. <laughs> it's embarrassing, but it, it, it can sometimes lead to a really beautiful life. It's not bad to have a little confidence, even no. if you haven't earned it yet, right? No, no. Yeah. And sometimes for kids, like it was all I had, you know? Yeah. And for, for kids like me, I recommend a little bit of audacity. If I went back and listened to you singing as a teenager, say, would I hear any of the voice I hear on stage no. today? None of that. Uh-uh. <laughs> totally different. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You'd hear no, um, like, power or drama or technique or any of the things that I really thrive on right now. I mean, I feel like right around the time I was um, 13 or 14, my love for Elton John and just, honestly, the gay 90s and the drama therein had formed to a point where I was wanting to sing like Freddie Mercury and there was, I wanted to have some glamorousness in my life vocally and, mm. and some elegance. And so I started to sort of um, dream of, of doing that, you know? Did they give you some sort of beacon as a young gay woman living yeah. in rural Washington? Like yeah, and being raised on country music and being such a, a Gemini, scallywag, trailer park country girl. And then there, here's this elegance and this elegance is really intertwined with queerness in a way that I couldn't even articulate, but I just knew I, wa I just wanted it. I wanted parts of it, you know? But I wanted to retain the rugged right. authenticity of, of who I am too, and I, I hope that I'm uh, achieving that and that I'm you know, setting myself up to honor both of these weirdos. <laughs> well, you're, you're doing that and then some. Um, so then as you move on, you do start to find that voice that I might recognize a little bit better. You put out your first album in 2005, but you'd, been, you'd had some success before that. You, people were noticing you. Do you remember when you felt like you'd made it, so to speak? The entire time. <laughs> if You're... I won a karaoke contest, if I was busking and there were 30 people when I opened my eyes, uh, the entire time. It was, it's, it's actually ridiculous. It could have been quite a miss. <laughs> Where does that come from? Where did that confidence come from? I don't know. I don't know, but it's like everybody always talks to me about, well, you've worked so hard at it. You know, you've worked so hard, you've worked so hard. And I'm like, I did? You know, I don't, I don't know if it really feels like that. When you really, really love it, you, all, you kind of tend to feel successful even in really hard times. Mm. And even rejection just feels like a fluke. Right. You know? Right. They don't get it. Yeah. But I think that the moments that really stand out in my mind as like, oh my God, like this has happened, are the ones that like involve my heroes. Mm. Like getting to sing with Elton or, you know, j watching Joni come back to Newport in the way that, that she just did. Those are the moments where I really realize that I've made it in a way that is a part of history and not just a part of me enjoying my life, which I do. I love this. You're like, you can ask a hundred different ways, but I always knew this was going to happen. <laughs> <laughs> Even when it probably wasn't going to happen. <laughs> it's so good, though. It's so good. But I think it's fair to say, let's take the story, for example. Yeah. That was a breakthrough moment, wasn't mm -hmm. it? A very popular song gets picked up in a commercial, runs during the Olympics. Yeah. Everyone goes, ooh, what's that song? Who mm -hmm. sings that? Was that a, a milestone, at least, in your career? Yeah, and the story was like, it took a, a 10 years for it to really have, you know, impacted in such a way that like would be like considered a hit, you know, because mm. I've never had one, not, not on radio, not, not in life, you know. And so I've been able to make sort of the trajectory of my career or my catalog like the, the hit as it, as it were. So I get to pick the songs I want to play on stage and all that stuff. But every night I sing the story because there's that note, you know, there's yeah. that moment of total triumph. There's that Freddie Mercury moment yeah. that I just can't do without. Yeah. I'll give you another moment. The Grammys, 2019. Oh, yeah. The performance is so good, but the message of the song resonates with anybody who's thinking about themselves or their kids or somebody they love. But also to me, it was just like a woman who had her moment. Mm -hmm. This is it. Mm -hmm. Let's see how you do it. Mm -hmm. And just blew the roof off the place. 
how great did you feel after that night? Everything changed after that. I mean, the shows got bigger. You know, the audiences got bigger. We started to make a little bit of money. Um, I, people called me, you know, cool people and famous people, and I got to... I got to start hanging out in circles that I was just reading about and a lot just changed. I just feel, I felt like, you know, I was looking at, at 40 and I had made it, made it. Has it been fun, Brandy, to get back out in front of crowds and to do all the things you did before the pandemic and just feel that energy and feel music again? I know it's been great to go to shows. How's it been for you out on tour? It's been so much fun. I mean, I didn't realize I've been thriving on it, you know, so completely since I was like eight years old. And I thought it made me who I was, you know? So in, on some level, it was good to know that um, when it went away that I actually still existed. <laughs> you know, in some other dimension, but it's uh, really beautiful to be back doing what I feel like I was meant to do again and just connecting with people. I need people. Yeah, I mean, you and you spent the time during the pandemic making music, yeah. making your, your album. What was that time like for you? Well, you know, we all live together. Um, my wife and I and our kids and our band, you know, we're trying to navigate school and being parents together. And it's interesting, it's like they say that it takes you your, your whole life to write your first album. And then your second one, you have to do it in about five and a half minutes. Right. And so that first album is always about coming of age and love and loss and heartbreak for the first time. And, you know, that you're lucky if you still have your parents. And then the second album is about touring. And no one can really relate to it until you're sort of Saturn return. You start approaching later in life. But there's a predictable trajectory. And what artists had during the pandemic was they had a new thing to write about that mm. the world as we know it hadn't experienced yet. And so I was fascinated by what do we learn? What did we learn about ourselves in this time? Because mm -hmm. we learned new things, and um, you know there was a lot of conversation about it. We've got this place in the woods that we all go down to every day at five o'clock and drink and try out conspiracy theories on one another, <laughs> and all that stuff made its way into the album. Yeah, yeah. I, people think you're joking. This is how you live. You live well, on, a, live. on a compound yeah. mm -hmm. no, I'm with not family, bandmates, kids, animals, all kinds of stuff. Oh yeah. What is that scene like on a typical day? <sighs> I mean, it's, it's, it's there. We can't see each other's houses. We just sort of get to each other's houses on four wheelers and stuff. Mm -hmm. um, but we always know that we're there for each other. We've been a band for 22 years, writing songs together, living and dying and fighting and going through rehab and just being you know, each, in each other's extended families as well. Mm. It's fascinating because we write about each other. Mm. And so I know when a song's been written about me and I have to sing it, you know what I mean? Yeah. Or I know um, that they've written about something difficult that's happened in their family and just from pure empathy, I can barely sing the words without, without crying. Mm. And um, the fabric of, of that relationship, it makes, I think, our writing prolific, but authentic because I'm not I'm not interpreting I'm in the story on the, in these silent days you've got songs about motherhood you got songs about being married you got songs about your faith mm -hmm. and that journey you've been on you've written and sung about those those themes before but did you get a new perspective on some of those those ideas that made it onto the album 
yeah, well, it's like, like I was saying, it was such a magnifying glass. You know what I mean? And also during that time, I had written a book. Yeah. And that's crazy. When you go to mine, mine your life and emotional trajectory chronologically like that, and it plays out in a linear way. And until you actually sit down to write it into something like a book, you're not remembering those things. Mm. And um, yeah, it made me want to write 10 albums. The book, which was a number one bestseller immediately, by the way, we should point <laughs> out that must have been crazy just to think, I'm gonna sit down, write through my life, I'll put it out in the world, we'll see what happens. What was it like to have it just explode the way it did? Man, I'm so proud of it because, I mean, for so many reasons. I think one of the main reasons is that because I didn't, because I dropped out of high school so young, um, I, and I have like diploma nightmares all the time where I'm like in school and I don't have my pants on and I need credits and I'm not going to graduate and I'm like 35. Um, you know, I think that having that book come out and do that well made me feel like in some ways like I finished something hmm. unfinished that had always sort of plagued me. It's like I've always really worried about whether or not I am fit to sit here and do these interviews and to express myself this way. And the book, you know, you can teach an old dog new tricks. Like it really changed my outlook on myself um, at this point in my life. What was that journey like for you to sit down and say, all right, whew, here we go. Here's my life. Well, it was so effortless. It just flew out of me. So it came out of me so fast. I basically had written the book in like five weeks. Hmm. And I thought a book was like this like thing was going to take me a long time. I had like two years planned, you know, to work on it. And it just poured out of me. And then I had to go back and look back at it and the things I was realizing about myself were the things I didn't necessarily love. Like, I think a lot of things are funny that are not funny. Mm. I'm quick to anger. I'm quick to judgment. I'm quick to, to, um, to things that I didn't think I was quick to. And I'm reading my own words and I'm like, did I say that? Do mm. I think that's funny? How mm. am I going to feel when so-and-so reads that? So there were a lot of, of um, conversations after the fact that did not go well for me and grew me up. Hmm. People who read the book yeah. and kind of challenged you on some of those things? Sure, yeah. And then I had some conversations where I had to set a healthy boundary and hold my own and say, well, actually, this is my story to tell, mm -hmm. you know, too. And so it's a very complicated line when you do this job and you become a public person because the people in your life, if you're lucky enough to have them alive, no matter what your past is, they didn't sign up to be a public right. person. Right. So what do you do? Right. I'm glad I didn't overthink it. <laughs> because now I don't know if I could do it again. So we talked about some of the songs on Silent Days, and now we've got this, I guess you call it, you'll describe it better than I do, but sort of the stripped down version 
of the album, the Canyon Haze. Mm -hmm. What's different about this version than what we heard last fall when, when it came out? Well, it's everything's different. It's almost like the upside down of it, mm. you know, with the ethos being to kind of conjure the sunsets and the Southern California folklore and the beauty and the lushness and the harmonies of the Laurel Canyon um, scene. And so it's kind of cool because anything on the album that was up-tempo is like now a ballad and vice uh, versa. And if it was on yeah. piano, now it's on guitar. If it was stripped down and just me alone, now it's like five-part harmony with mamas and papas call and answer beautiful things. And it was just honestly um, a joy. It was a lot of work to create it, but it was a joy. It's truly beautiful. People are going to love it, and they're going to love that there's some David Bowie on there. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> wow, where did that come from? That's amazing. We were recording the song for a movie, and towards the end of uh, In the Canyon Haze, I was like, this is a project that I love, but this is not really the direction I'm going in as an artist, but it's just, it's this... It's sequestered off. It's its own island, you know? Mm. So I started feeling like, I don't want people to think this is like what I'm going to do next, you know? <laughs> so I wanted to just like throw that David Bowie song on there at the end and be like, just kidding. <laughs> Glam rock. Oh my God. It's such a nice gem <laughs> dropped in there. Is that fun to sing a song like Space Oddity? Oh my God. It's deliriously fun. It's like wildly exciting. I've been doing it live every night oh. and it's just oh, unapologetic drama. I also love the high women, what you did with that. And it gets to something you were talking about before, which is lifting the profile of women, not just in country music, but, but in music broadly. It's a tribute, obviously, to the, the highway men of, of yeah. yore. Yeah. Um, what was the, the idea behind that? Why was that so important to you to put that group together? I mean, that, the group of, of the high women has just become so much more than the band. It's just, it's a conversation, it's a movement, and it's evolving to this day you know, to shine a light on the people that country music um, leaves behind, frankly. You know, so many of us live this, these rural lifestyles and we love these themes of, of family and values and faith and, you know, living on the land and working with your hands. And these things are ubiquitous. They're for people of color. They're for, they're for LGBTQIA plus people too. And country music tends to really acknowledge only one kind of person. And since country music raised me, and it was the only thing for a really long time in my life that I was given access to, those themes of only one kind of person, they didn't help. They didn't help me when mm. I reached my adolescence and I needed to see myself mm. in the music that I loved. And I found it where I needed to find it. But um, even when I was young, I didn't have much to complain about because we had so many more uh, diverse country singers then than we do now. And that's jarring. Is progress moving backward, which I think we're seeing so much more than we want to see. And why is that? Why do you think that is in the world of country music? <laughs> because you're right, you think about Tanya Tucker and Loretta and Dolly and all the people that you've worked with. Mm -hmm. You don't see as much of that today, do you? You really don't. No. And even like 80s and 90s country, you know, everything from Trisha and Faith and yeah. the Judds all the way to the Chicks. and. All of these things that were so, you know, omnipresent in our lives on the radio, you know, uh, VH1 behind the music documentaries, you're just diving into the lives, honestly, of women, and to be clear, mostly white women. Um, but at least I was seeing themes I could relate to. Mm. And I feel like quite critical of country music now, particularly mainstream country music, mm. where we're really hearing a lot about women only belonging in pickup trucks, sitting beside a man in some little shorts with a koozie. Hmm. And like, that's not the message I want my daughter to hear. High Woman serves this message for, I think for everyone, frankly, yeah. yeah. It's a bit of a protest and it's a nice bonus that the songs are amazing and that you, you guys are so so good together. It's kind of an invitation too, you know, it's like a bus ticket. It's yeah. Like, come on, join the High Woman. Right, Tell right. your stories. Have you felt over the years, Brandy, excluded because you are a gay woman living in this world that, you know, it's Americana, but it is country. Yeah. Totally. From country music, yeah. but from many other genres, um, not in a conscious way. And I do sort of feel like I want to shine a light in those corners to people that may not know that they're, that they're excluding other people, mm. you know? Because even I've excluded other people in my life. And until, I, until it was explained to me, until I understood that I wasn't making an effort, you know, to paint with a, with a broader brush, I didn't. And um, so I have faith 
in the genre, that it can evolve. You mentioned all these legends that you've worked with, with Joni Mitchell being the, the most extraordinary example recently at Newport, um, just this summer. Can you take us inside some of those jam sessions we hear about at her house where I think this idea was sort of born? Like, what's it like? Because we understand no cameras, no nothing. Yeah. Lock it down. She's like, park your pistols at the door. That's what she says. <laughs> <Does she? laughs> yeah. And so what's it like in there to the extent you can say publicly? Oh, yeah. I mean it's it's incredible and it's it's a uh, unifying you know it's it's not overly glamorous it's um, very musical everyone's nervous no mm. one's no one's famous you can be sitting there with you know uh, Joni's neighbor and a friend from Canada and Harry Styles and everyone's the same you know he's just as nervous as they are and it's it's amazing because it, it sets up. You set a bar for yourself. I set a bar for myself as a songwriter after the jam. I was saying to you earlier, I didn't realize it's been 20 years since you'd done a, a live show like that. Did it take any cajoling, or was this the plan? She she invites you over and says, "Hey, the voice is here. <laughs> if you want to hear it again, did you have to twist her arm at all, or was she excited to come to Newport with you?" There was a moment um, right before we left where I think that she had a, a, a she hesitated. For a second so we had a FaceTime and I was like Joni since you've introduced me to this group of people by allowing us to come together in your living room and play our music for you you know and set these barometers for ourselves like you've created a, a family a scene based on your living room your recovery and your music mm -hmm. all we want to do is tribute you so if you just sit there let us sing to you and thank you and she's like I get the spirit of it now I'll be there you know we're doing this <laughs> And then she opened her mouth and sang every song. Yeah. <laughs> no one knew. Oh, is that right? That she was going to do that. Oh, I didn't realize that. Yeah. So she surprised you with how far she went with it. With what, how uh, far she went, how loud she sang, how yeah. confidently, how beautifully she sang when she stood up and played that guitar part. We'd all heard her fiddling around with it, but we had never heard her do it to that extent oh where gosh. it was just like an absolute triumph. And we were crying and like yeah. carrying on because we were just as moved as everybody else was and totally blown away. Is that a surreal thing for you to be able to even have a FaceTime with Joni Mitchell, to be invited to Joni Mitchell's house, to go on vacation with Elton John? It's something so wonderful, like no one deserves it. Mm -hmm. um, to sort of be in this place of like total awe, but then also don't fangirl out too much and freak out to the point where it looks like you don't belong here, you know? So right. you have to strike this balance right. in between. So I guess the best thing I can do is just have like enormous gratitude, but stay in my body so that I don't lose sight of the fact that this is happening to me in my life, you know? That's what, that's how I get to live here yeah. right now. Does it ever strike you, you've earned your place on vacation with Elton John? You've earned your place playing a guitar next to Joni Mitchell because of how extraordinarily talented you are? All my friends that are musicians and they're just in vans and they're just working so hard and they're so good and some of them are so much better 
than me. It's hard for me to be like, well, I've earned my place. But I do feel very proud of myself. What about the idea that the way you looked up to them now, there are young artists who say, I want to be Brandi Carlile. I want to sing like that. I love oh, that. I want, to, I want to perform the way she performs. What does that feel like? I believe it. I accept it. I take it all in. I accept the responsibility of it that comes with it. And um, it's what I always wanted. Hmm. And um, it's, a, it's a distinct honor, especially people that are at risk, especially people that are underprivileged and that don't feel seen or represented, even in their own families or their schools or their church. Like, to know that they're looking at a concert or reading a book or listening to a record and going, there's another side to this. Hmm. You know, I get out of this eventually and maybe, maybe it's that for me. You know, I really relate to it. Well, that's the more profound piece of it, which the music is one thing. They want to be like you on stage, but the way you talk about Ellen DeGeneres, young kids and young women and young boys talk about you. That's got to kind of melt your brain a little bit. Yeah, yeah. I see them from stage and stuff too, you know? Yeah, yeah. And it's like, I get really excited in my head about it when I'm out on stage. I'm looking out at it, people. And I'm like, yep, that's me, that's me, that's uh, me, that's me, and that's me. <laughs> it's amazing. Quite a ride, yeah, right? It is quite a ride. Okay, so you've worked with almost everyone I think you want to work with. Who's still out there? Do we need to send a signal right now to someone? <sighs> I've really been thinking about this lately. Do okay. you know what it is? is that Elton John's been my greatest hero since I was 11 years old. He was a major turning point in my life in almost every way that, that a person can affect another person. But I still have never got to perform with Elton John. Never? No. Oh. Can't we just make that happen? That's what we got to do. I mean, but we don't know, because the tour, you know, it's like, when's he going to be? And so, oh. yeah. I think he may show up at one of your shows. Mm. I'm going to put that in the atmosphere. Well, maybe I'll show up to a couple more of his. Mm. This, I feel like this is already happening, and this is you're very good at like just planting a seed. <laughs> That's what I wonder sometimes. <laughs> Has it already happened? Do I just really want it to happen, or did it happen in some other dimension? There's that confidence again. It's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> it's going to happen. Congratulations on your success. It's so great to talk to you. Oh, nice. It was really nice to talk to you, yeah. too. What a great interview. Huge Thank fan. You. Huge Thank fan. You. treasure trove. Yeah, it's just all kinds of, this is fun stuff. I could get lost in this all day. This is the rehearsal space? This is the rehearsal now? space. Yeah. This is where, you know, we've pretty much got this set up as we would set up on our stage at a show. It's a, like a playhouse, I imagine, for a musician. You it's, come in here, guitars and drums and whatever else you yeah, need. Yeah, it's a candy store a little <laughs> bit. So, and it's a, it's a place to put all that stuff, you know, and, and have it out and, you know, oh, yeah, let's grab that and see what this does, you know. And then you might find a hit song, just grabbing things off the wall. Well, that's the <laughs> hope. You know, that's the hope. But also the hope is just that, you know, you get to make the, make the sounds that give the vibrations that make it feel like the right thing, you know. Baby, no one oh, finds those vibrations quite change. like Chris Stapleton. This might sound strange, but... On his latest album, the 45-year-old reaches back to his earliest days in Nashville, long before the world knew his name. The t title track, Higher, is, what, what year is it? It's 22 years old, 23 years old. And that's some, one of the, that was all, song was on the first demo session I ever did when I moved to town as a songwriter. So I wrote that song by myself, and, and it's been hanging around ever since. So, so that's 2001. You've yeah. just come to town, your first demo. Yeah. So that's been sitting there waiting to be something for a couple of decades. How do you decide when to pull that one off the shelf and put it in an album? Well, that one's pretty... Uh, high level of difficulty as far as uh, singing goes and um, for me maybe not for somebody you're up else, there but yeah some of those notes <laughs> and uh, I don't know I, I think I was probably afraid of it for a long time and my wife was would always would always push for that song and she was like you should try that and I was like I don't, I don't know if I have it right now I don't know if I have that one anymore you know because like I wrote it when I was 23 you know like and you get to be in your 40s you're like oh, maybe I don't have what I used to have but <laughs> 
I've been working with a really uh, great vocal coach named Rob Stevenson, who has helped me really, you know, not only get back some of the things that I thought I didn't have anymore, but find some other other range that's well, really nice. So where we cut that song is about it's at least a step, maybe a step and a half higher than it was when I did the demo. In oh, is that right? So wow. it was a little bit of a, you know, like a challenge to myself to try to do it, I think. So, um, and that one, that one was, you know, a little bit of a battle to get, but we got it. You've got range with this thing that extends your range. Well, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, that's me on a good day. <laughs> Stapleton taking that one-of-a-kind voice even higher. question I think I've never asked you or talked to you about is when you first realized your voice was special or different, was there a parent or a music teacher or somebody who said, because your voice is so distinctive. Well, my parents always told me I was special and different, as any good parent would, you know. But um, Was it early in your life? Was it when you got to Nashville? When did people say, hmm, there's something different about him? I always sang, so that was always like one of one of my things that I would do. I think at some point, people only maybe regard it as special or something when you start to have some kind of notoriety with it, you know. Mm -hmm. Like otherwise, you're a dude that sings, you know. Like there's lots of people that can sing, you know. Well, the road rolls out like a welcome night. I don't know anybody who sings like you. In other words, the way that voice comes out of that beard. Well, that takes is different. I think that that maybe takes. Uh, even when I moved to town, if you listen to things from when I moved to town, I'm not the same singer. You know, I spent a lot of time trying to be other people, you know, like, uh, I love Vince Gill. I've, I've, I've tried so hard to be Vince Gill and sound like Vince Gill. There's lots of, lots of recordings of demo recordings of me, like wishing I was Vince Gill or, you know, um, but I'm not, I'm not any of those people. And, and eventually you hopefully through all those influences and, um, also focusing on what it is that you do, um, uh, you find out what that is and then you put that out there and, and that's if that's some something special that people think is special that's great stapleton found his voice for good in 2015 with his grammy winning debut solo album traveler in the eight years since he has earned eight grammys won 15 country music association awards and most recently was named the Academy of Country Music's Entertainer of the Year. In February, another milestone for Stapleton, when he was invited to stand alone on one of the world's biggest stages. What is the level of nervousness going into the Super Bowl uh, anthem? Terrified, exponentially beyond belief. <laughs> but. The national anthem is a hard one yeah. for any singer, I don't care who you are, on a number of levels, because you can be immortalized for really screwing it up, or you can do a passable, serviceable job, and everybody's like, all right, cool, he, he got it right. Or, you, you know, hopefully you get something beyond that. But just to get through it, if you get through it, there's, there's this, your shoulders drop, and, and you go, okay, I didn't screw any of that up. I don't have to hear about it forever. I, I, you know, there's no, I didn't fall down or, you know, there, it, it's a, it's a lot of eyes on that song and a lot of judgment on that song if you, if you get it wrong. So I might've worked on that more than I worked on anything <laughs> to do uh, for any television performance ever. But I was very nervous. I had a sinus infection that day. So I didn't do, I shot away from some things that I might've done mm. as a, as a singer that day, but whoever, what well, really the power of that after I watched it and I didn't, I don't like to watch things back, but people were like, man, you should really go watch it. Go watch it. Whoever did all the edits with the coaches and yeah. the, the guys on the, on the ship and the, and, and the fly, the, it was a, it was a really brilliant bit of editing in my mind that really made it feel maybe more powerful than it would have, you know, with just me doing it. Were you aware afterward that the Eagles head coach had tears coming down his face, that Jason Kelsey was choked up, and that you had a role in that? Yeah, I, you know, I, I was aware after people were like, oh, you made, you know, you're making people cry. I was like, oh, okay, good. I'm going to go watch the game. <laughs> 
And, you know, I was, you know, there's a lot of coming down off of something like that where you're just like, all right, I, I did it. I did it. I, I did that thing. And the whole of and now the debate is Whitney Stapleton, the best Super Bowl anthem of all time. So well, I'll, I know you won't I'll weigh in on I'll that. I'll defer. <laughs> This is the chair that I have sat in for every record that we've made, but it it was in my parents' uh, little kitchenette. But I always have carried this chair with me. I moved to town with this chair. And so I sit in this chair anytime I'm um, making records and I'm, and I'm sitting down. Sometimes I'm standing up. But if I'm sitting down in a, in a creative capacity, this is the chair. So what's the significance of it to you? It's a comfortable chair. <laughs> But, uh, so, <laughs> that's where it ends. <laughs> well, that's the main part as, as I get older. But um, it, uh, you know, I like to have little things with you that, that you carry with you through time. And I think those things inform what we do in ways that maybe you can't completely understand. But uh, if you have those little bits with you while mm -hmm. you're doing it, uh, whether it's a thing or a mentality or whatever it is, I think that that's good. I think that's a good thing. So that's it's that's familiar. It's home. It's familiar. So, it's home. Yeah, yeah. it feels so, comfortable. Stapleton also finds the comfort of home standing next to him on stage. Sing my Sarah, halo. He and his talented wife Morgan, who met as young songwriters and now share five children, write, produce, and perform together. Broken halos that used to shine. White Horse is the hit that's out right now, yeah. first single off the album. What is that song about exactly? And is it true that when you ran it by Morgan, as you do everything, she was like, I don't know. I don't well, know that's, that, yeah, that song's the, the, the reverse of higher. It's just like, I would bring that one up because I <laughs> like rock. I like guitar licks and stuff. That's, yeah. that's how I hear things. I, I don't think of songs as lyrical things. or uh, I, I, It takes me so long to hear lyrics in a song. I want to hear all the other stuff first. I'll listen to everything in a song mm. maybe 10 times before I even hear what somebody's saying. And if all that stuff feels good to me, then I'll start paying attention to what the lyrics are. So I think of songs in the reverse of most, uh, maybe songwriters, but maybe people in general, I don't know. But I think those things are important to me more than yeah. uh, lyrics are even. But I always liked that groove. And, and uh, me and Dan Wilson wrote that song and uh, yeah, I always just wanted it. We played it. We used to play it out live a long time ago, uh, pre, pre Traveler, and it just kind of crept back up. I said, well, maybe we can try it again, and if we hook it, maybe you'll be okay with it. <laughs> and I, I think she, she liked it after we, we got it. I think so, what I'm hearing so far, Chris, is Morgan gets approval on these songs. Oh, of course. Yeah. Or at least discussion. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it'd be like, hey, just let me have this one thing, you know, like. But well, she's got good taste. Oh, yeah, great. So, and everything but men, that's what I like to say. <laughs> I don't know. I think she did all right.
you said Higher was uh, written in 2001 for, for a demo, and that's the title track on this album. Does that give you a moment of pause to look back at the last 22 years and to think, my gosh, I came to Nashville hoping some of this would maybe happen, and it's so far exceeded my dreams? Is it a marker for you? Certainly there's always moments to reflect, and I've talked about, uh, I think, a lot of times in interviews, how songs but gain meaning over time, or the meanings change over time. And so I don't know exactly how that's going to hit me when I hear it out in the world or see how people respond to it. I think I'll have different feelings. That's when the songs get meaning to me, is when people assign the meaning to them. You know, I can think a song means one thing, and I can write it, and I can sing it, and then it goes out into the world, or you see people singing it back, and you see that it means something to them that's probably not what you intended, mm. or maybe it's exactly what you intended, but it, you see it in real time. It's got to be something when a stadium full of people sings any song that you sat in a room and wrote, and they love it so much and it means so much that they know all the words. It doesn't get old. It's, it's a really humbling and addictive experience, you know, at the same time. You know, you, when you hear that, it's a, it's a buzz, you know, to, to hear that. On a Nashville ride from struggling songwriter to music icon, Stapleton still prefers to let his songs be the stars. I don't do this for the fame part. It's that I was never, that's not a thing I like to chase. I'm in it for the music part mainly and the fun part, you know. And we're well beyond that, that you know, that's how I make a living. But um, that's, uh, yeah, that's what I'm in it for. Is there a different energy generally in New York? Always. Do you feel that? Yeah. Always. You know, when you come to New York, you can't have your B show. You gotta have your A show because last night they saw somebody that killed him. Right. After a few years out making music and touring with his buddies in Hootie and the Blowfish, Darius Rucker has returned to country. Turn on the good times, turn off the TV. Yeah, the only BS I need is beers and sunshine. What's the response been like to the, the new album? Oh, it's been great. I mean, we've been playing four, about four new songs off the record, and people are loving it. And I, I, as, a, as, as a musician, especially a guy, somebody puts records out like I do, you just want that. You want, I want songs I can play live, songs that are going to resonate with people because the live shows are still why I do it. And it's been a minute since you've put out a solo album. What was it about this moment where you said, all right, I'm ready. It's time to say something again. It, it was time, you know, I just wanted to go play. I just wanted to go play country because I wasn't really thinking about making a record. And then finally, it was just like, man, I'm ready to, to write some songs. Those songs make up the new album, Carolyn's Boy, a tribute to Rucker's late mother, who died before her son's massive success. You soothe my soul like an old church hymn. Amen. Why did you dedicate this album to her? I mean, it was funny. I was uh, writing the song, and we, we started the recording, and I was having a bad day, you know, one of those bad mental health days. I just wasn't doing well. And I just remember sitting there and thinking, at the end of the day, I'm just my mom's boy. And right there, so I named the record Carolyn's Boy, because really that's, in my heart, that's who I am. I'm just my mom's kid. And what does that mean to you, to be Carolyn's boy? She taught us to be nice. She taught us to care. She taught us to give back. She taught us to always 
be the best person you can be. And I, I really hope that, you know, she's looking down from heaven and I'm, I'm that man she wanted me to be. Born and raised in Charleston, South Carolina, Rucker is one of six children. Carolyn was a single mother who worked double shifts as a nurse to support the family. What was that household like? And now that you've grown up and you're a parent yourself, yeah. how much more respect even do you have for what your mom was able to do? Oh, absolutely. Being a parent, you really get it. You, you get it. And you know, for me, we, we were lucky. We had a village. My brothers and sisters were all still real close and everything. And my mom just taught us family. Family's everything. And, and that's something I took on to with my kid and, and you know, with their lives. And what influence did your mom have on the music? I know you grew up in the church, listening to music like so many good yeah. Southern young boys and Absolutely. girls did. That's where it starts. And then you graduate to Al Green that's playing yeah. in the house. Was your mom a big part of your musical influence? She was the biggest part. She was a huge part because she always, there was always music playing. There was never music not playing in the house, whether it was radio or records or whatever. And we had one of those big high fives, you know, yeah. that had all the records inside. And, and I would just listen to records. And, she was great because she never let anybody tell me what I could listen to. Like my cousins would come over and I'd be listening to a rock and roll on the radio or something, or a country on the radio. And, and they'd come and ask me, you know, why you listen to that white boy music? And she would just lit into that. She would lit in, light into them and let them know you let him listen to what he wants to listen to. And, and it was great. She, I, I always say, I, I don't think I could have sang the songs I sang and made the music I made if my mom wasn't always a champion and protecting me from people telling me I couldn't. But like, I always say she, she influenced all of the music. So she, I mean, she had good musical taste. Oh, yeah. I mean, really good musical taste. Oh, great musical taste. Because she was such a singer. She was a light years better than I am as a singer. And I would sit in the living room and sit, just listen to her singing because she was so amazing. Rucker stepped in front of the mic himself in 1986 when he and three friends at the University of South Carolina formed a band called Hootie and the Blowfish. <laughs> became so popular on the Southern College circuit, the guys decided to make music a full-time job. I wanna love you the best that, the best that I can. Unfortunately, she didn't get to see you become the massive international star that you've become, but she saw you on your way. Oh, she yeah. saw you off to college, knew you were playing those kind of gigs. Yep. What kind of encouragement did she give you along the way? She never, when I told her it was a band and everything, she always encouraged me. I'll never forget the day after my junior year that I was going to tell her I was going to quit college. And I thought she was going to destroy me. I thought, you know, that was not going to be an option. And she looked at me and she said, if that's what you want to do, if this music thing is what you're going to do, do it. Wow. And that was a great day for me because I realized I had her behind me. No matter what I had, you know, I didn't think I had a backup plan until I, she said that. And I was like, well, I guess she's my backup plan. For years, the band toured constantly, enjoying modest success, until a 1994 appearance on David Letterman's show changed everything. Ladies and gentlemen, Hootie and the Blowfish. He heard us on Tuesday, had us on on Friday. And that, that Friday morning, there was maybe five stations in the country playing it and all in the South, you know, Columbia yeah. and Charleston and Atlanta. And that Monday, we were the most added. And after that, it just went crazy. It changed our lives. Overnight. Overnight. The debut album, Cracked Rear View, went platinum 21 times over, placing it among the best-selling albums in the history of music, earning the band two Grammy Awards and making Hootie one of the biggest acts in the world. And just let her cry if the tears fall down like I was looking at the list of the best-selling albums of all time, and it's in the top 10. I mean, it's yeah. Led Zeppelin and the Beatles and all the Eagles and everything we Michael know. Jackson, Michael yeah. Jackson. Michael yeah. Jackson. Does that still blow your mind? Blows my mind. Yeah. Then we were like the eighth best-selling record of all time. Yeah. And blows your mind. That That's like, like wow. I mean, up there with all those people that we vitalize and think are great and all those records that we think are great. Do you remember a time you walked out on a stage and the crowd suddenly was big and the crowd suddenly was singing all the songs back to you? Yeah. Is that, were there, was there a moment or maybe a couple of moments like I that? The, there, was a moment, there was a moment where uh, we were playing this, this uh, uh, we were playing a park in Columbia, a charity gig we were playing in 90, at, after, right after Letterman, and walking out and seeing, you know, 20, 30,000 people freak out. And then two weeks later, we play 
We play East, East Lansing, Michigan. I'll never forget this. Play East Lansing, Michigan, and play in this big outdoor place that they can sell as many tickets as they want. And we get on stage, and there's 77,000 people. Come on. So to what do you attribute 21 million albums? The songs are great, fun to sing along with. It's good music. We start there. But why did it become some other thing than just a successful album? I think I, I think the only thing we can attribute it to is the songs and the production. I mean, the songs are great songs because it was one of those things where, you know, before streaming, we were at, you know, 15 or 16 or whatever. And, you, you know, you're in the top 15 selling records all of a sudden. That's great. But then streaming happens. And it's a whole new thing. It's a whole new thing. And people still want the record. And, and it's just one of those things where for us, I, I like to think it's just the songs we wrote. We had lighting in the bottle. We wrote some great songs yeah. that people still resonate with. And that that's what you want to do. How did you manage that part of the celebrity side of it? which no one's ready for it to happen that no, quickly. No, gonna sell. We weren't ready for it, but the, we were lucky that we had each other. And we were always together. And and we never let each other get a big head or, let, or take it too serious. You know, it was always, anytime you try to do that, there was somebody, always somebody to cut you down. You know, we couldn't even wear black t-shirts back then without somebody letting you know, <laughs> what are you, a bono? Who are you? Who are you? you you're any better now? <laughs> so it was like, we had each other and that's how we dealt with it. Just staying insulated in our little group and realizing that the only thing we saw in this show was getting bigger. The show was getting bigger and somebody back could me in the airport. That, that's all we saw. It was still, we would still just inform us. In 2008, Hootie took a break and Rucker went solo, turning to his southern musical roots. I got all I need, and it's all right by me. I always said, someday I want to make a country record. Someday I'm making a country record. Someday I'm making a country record. And that day finally came. Did you feel skepticism when you made that turn from radio stations, fans, everybody going, whoa, whoa, whoa. Understatement. What are we doing here? Understatement. I got lucky and got a record deal. And I, it's, it's so funny, the uh, the guy who gave me a record deal, Mike Dungan, said to my manager, Doc, he's like, you know, I never got that hootie thing, but I always thought that kid was a country singer. <laughs> and he gave, me a, he gave me a record deal, and I'm out visiting radio station stuff, and three radio station guys said this to me, to my face, I don't think my audience will ever accept a black country singer. Mm. And that was, I mean, the first time I heard it was shocking, because, you know, I knew they probably kind of felt that way, but you actually said it to me, you know? And, and that was more motivation for me. That was more, okay, how hard, how, what do you want me to do? How hard do I have to work? Tell me what I got to do to make this work. It worked right away. His first single raced to the top of the country charts, the first of his eight number one songs there. Among them, a 2013 rendition of Wagon Wheel which now is one of the best-selling country songs of all time. So ride me mama like a wagon wheel Ride me mama any way you feel Hey mama ride me 
it is even sitting here, it's shocking to hear that someone would say the things they said to your face sure. that a black artist can't make it in country music. Did you carry that with you when you went in? Did you feel any weight of like, I'm this breakthrough artist, I'm breaking barriers and all those things? Or was it just like, write the, good songs? The one thing I wanted to do was write good songs. I was like, let's make a great record, write good songs, all the other stuff comes with it. But once I made it, I wanted to see other people make it. I think everybody's looking for it an African-American artist, that's great, that I can get on the radio, that can be part of my stable, to be part of what we do at our label. And, you know, I, I love being, you know, one of the catalysts for that, that's pretty cool. We always think we're gonna hatred and all this stuff's gonna keep, but when, and at the bottom line, people just want great music. Mm -hmm. That's all they want, is great music, a great song. I don't care what you look like or what you do. I want a great song, and you know, that's what we try to get. You keep giving it to him, yeah. Rucker is living a full circle moment, from listening to his mother sing in the family kitchen, to naming his latest hit album for the woman who planted the seeds of his life in music. Take me back to Carolina when the Lord says it's my time. Do you think about what she must be thinking somewhere? All the time. All the time. Uh, I, I, think, I think about two things. Which, uh, that I hope she's in heaven that looking down being proud of me. And second of all, I always go, if she was alive, her house would be so much bigger than mine. <laughs> And she would have earned that, too. <laughs> earned that Her car would be nicer than mine. <laughs> It'd be awesome. Whatever you want, Mom. Hey, whatever you want, Mom. Hey, you could have it, for sure. It, I mean, to have listened to all that music with you, to have stilled it in you, and then to see what you've done with it, I just can't imagine what she's thinking somewhere. And that's really what it is. I mean, music was our life. She instilled all of that. My love for music came from her. And, and all I've wanted to do since I was four mm -hmm. was play music. And I'm 57 now, and I've been doing it for 30 years on the big stage. It's just crazy. Crazy. I know she's proud of it. Uh, I like to think she is. Hey.